how do people make those epic product videos? When you look at some of them like iPhone ads, for example, it can feel kind of intimidating. What's going through the minds of those video artists as they're creating their shots? Is there an actual professional process that they're taking when they're deciding what to make and how to make it? So today, this is what we're gonna tap into. But before I go any further, I wanna show you guys exactly what we'll be building today. I can't take no loss. I don't even know what it costs. I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, really feel it's my time. Think it's my. I bought the hat. I had to. I could not get the hat. I guess you could say the video worked on myself. Anyways, what should you expect to get out of this video? We're gonna first put our product model together in Blender, which today is gonna be a hat. To create that, we're gonna take our leather patch that we created in our other videos and pop that guy onto our model. And while we're at it, we're gonna learn how to deform the patch along the actual curve of the hat, which isn't as easy as I thought it should be. We're gonna create our virtual studio in Blender and talk about the parallels between real life shots and 3D rendering. Then we're gonna actually map out our camera shots, but not just any shots. We're gonna be very intentional about it. I'm gonna share a specific way of thinking that I began to use during this process that seriously changed the way I went about building product videos, hopefully for the better, because even though I certainly care about those little tiny details sometimes too much my goal with these videos at the end of the day is to really help bring up perspective shift so that you can see things in a new way and hopefully make better stuff because of it we're gonna talk about music tracks and the thought process we're gonna to take to select the best one for our video and how we can go about actually aligning the clips to the beat of the song we're gonna talk about a render workflow that I began to use that can save a lot of time and finally we're gonna dabble into a little bit of video editing so that we can pull it all together this one's gonna be really fun guys I I've been planning this one for way too long. Let's get into it. All right, let's begin by getting our hat and patch prepared for our video. To do that, we're gonna first just delete our default cube. We're gonna to come to our file append. We're gonna drill into the tutorial from last video where we added the logo to our patch. And in that video, we learned all about image textures and how they actually work within the shader. We can dive into that, head on over to our collections and let's toss in our patch. Let's come to our material preview view just to make sure that our logo still appears as we expected. There it is. And just like last time, let's pull patch into the root scene collection and then we'll rename this other one to studio. And now let's bring in our hat. So lots of different options for pulling your 3D models. In my case, I found a good looking hat from Sketchfab. Now with Sketchfab, even though there are a lot of free models on there, just note that a lot of them require attribution. You need to give credit to the guy or girl who actually built it, which is important. Interestingly, Sketchfab actually has their own add-on for Blender. Once installed, it will be available to you within this sidebar. So I'm hitting N on my keyboard to pull that up, or you can hit this arrow. You'll just need to log in to the plugin, which I've already done. And then you can actually go ahead and search for your models directly within this add-on, which is convenient. If we search for a baseball hat, then this will uh, pull up a page of results to see all the options. You can just click on that and then here are all the hats. I've already taken a look at some of these and the one I like best is this one right here, um, created by Oluafemi. And as you'll see here in the licensing, this does require attribution. So let me just quickly pull up the link for you guys. So here's a model on Sketchfab. I like this model in particular because he even included this nice FlexFit logo. Um, I've realized I am actually quite picky when it comes to hats in real life and personally just love these flex fits. They fit really nicely. Um, as you can see too with this model he's included this Travis Matthews uh, tag on the side so what we'll do is we'll actually just replace that with our own logo as well. If you didn't have the plugin what you do is just come on down to download 3D model. You do need to be logged in for this. Once logged in you can go back to download and often they'll give you a bunch of different formats. When you're using the add-on what it will do under the hood is actually go for this GLTF format. Blender knows how to pull in a GTL GLTF, so that's why it goes for that. And then back to licensing, this is CC attribution. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy the credits using this button and I'll go ahead and paste those into the description of this video. And then you guys can check out all of me and some of the models that he's created. Back to Blender. Since I am using the add-on, I'm just gonna go ahead and click on this import button. And in the top right, you can see that we do now have a baseball cap added to our scene. And whoa, that guy looks super tiny. But we need to ask ourselves, 
is it actually tiny? If we take a quick look here, you can see that the width of this hat is actually around 16 centimeters, which is actually quite close to the size of a real hat. Um, if we were intense, what we could do right now is pull out our measuring tape and go from one end to the other. So this is about 14 centimeters tall, actually closer to 18 centimeters wide. And then let's go to the back of the head there, around 30-ish centimeters deep. And relatively speaking, I think this is actually very close to the size of a real hat. So good job once again, Oluwafemi, for setting your scale properly on the hat. By the way, for the measurements, if you're ever wondering how to get rid of them, you can select them and hit X to delete. Or the other option is just to come to your view. Interestingly enough, measurements are actually saved in annotations. So you can just go ahead and remove that annotation. It won't go away right away. You got to change your view and come back and they're gone. So Oluwafemi set the dimensions properly on this hat. I, however, was completely off on the patch. This patch is actually let's look at this if we go to our item yeah it's like 11 meters wide <laughs> so maybe not quite accurate so one easy solution here is just to scale this down but as you can see we'd have to scale our stitch and patch separately right now is probably best practice to parent our stitch to our patch right anytime we move our patch around or scale it we probably want our stitch to go with it so to do that we can just select both we'll select the patch second which will end up being the parent Control or command p uh, object and now you can see up here that our stitch is now a child of our parent, meaning that if I transform our parent, our stitch child will transform with it. So I could scale this way down. Uh, let's zoom in there, keep going. But where do we want this? Um, let's bring this up a bit. By the way, some of you might not know this. Um, when you're moving things around in Blender or scaling or rotating, I'm sure most of you know, obviously G allows you to move it around anywhere, but this is from the perspective of my current view, which is at like this random angle. A lot of you know that you can just hit G followed by an axis. So like Z would only move it in the Z axis, X x-axis and y y-axis so that's a one way to move things around precisely but at least it took me a while to learn this one but another cool one is if you hit g but and then instead of z you hit shift z what that does is actually locks it to that plane so instead of being locked to one axis it's actually being locked to um, multiple axes so if you can see i'll do it again it's actually getting locked to that z plane which I actually end up using this one all the time because I want to kind of move it around on this Z plane in both the X and Y direction, but I don't want it to go up and down and that's perfect for this scenario. Of course, you can do that for any axis. Y will lock it to the Y plane. Uh, Shift X will lock it to the X plane as well. So in case you didn't know that, let's rotate this guy 90 degrees on the X axis. And now we can start to line this up with our hat. We want the patch to be approximately this size. So maybe we'll scale that down just a little bit more. And now how do we attach attach this patch to the hat. Um, ideally it would be, you know, on the exact angle on the surface there. So we kind of have to like tediously rotate things, but until it kind of matches, what if we want to move it? Now we gotta keep doing it over and over again. Turns out there's a better way. So in case you haven't used it before, Blender has this snapping feature, which is super customizable. You can snap according to a whole bunch of different options. But if we go ahead and snap to faces, so by projecting onto faces, um, we have a couple different options here. We can snap to the closest face or the center of our object onto the target. So let's try center. Now if I take our object and put my cursor on another surface, you can see it's actually dynamically moving the position, snapping to the surface of this hat. Now it's not perfect because it's not rotating with us, but turns out there's a handy feature here called align rotation to target. If we hit that guy, it'll actually perfectly rotate our patch to basically align with the normal of that part of the hat, which is pretty much perfect for our scenario right now. So I think we want to put the patch kind of in this bottom right hand corner here. Now, one thing to note here is it's it, it isn't perfect, really, if you want to be extremely exact, meaning that the, the face behind this patch isn't perfectly flat, right? And that's why you can see on the very edges here, it's the patch is actually kind of going into the material. And then it's kind of flat here against it, and then it has to go into it again. And that's just because between this point and this point, the hat actually is curving, whereas our patch is not. If you guys really want to try to account for this, you could start playing around with the modifiers. The simpler but more tedious approach would be to probably just use like a deform where you can actually bend or taper the object. Um, you gotta make sure you get your axes right with this simple deform. Uh, a more precise approach, but takes a little bit more work would be to use a combination of the shrink wrap modifier and the surface deform modifier. So uh, real quick, shrink wrap is pretty cool because it will actually project your shape onto another object. The problem being that shrink wrap will basically end up turning your object into a flat surface. So let me do it real quick. If I do shrink wrap and then I choose um, my hat, 
then you can see it's actually flattened my patch down to literally quote unquote shrink wrap it to the surface. You can play around with like the offset, but it's uh, not super flexible there. So anyways, another option here is to use this surface deform, which will basically, instead of flattening our object, it will actually deform it according to another surface, which sounds like it's exactly what we want. Now, the only issue is the way this deform works is that it needs a starting point before you start deforming it, right? So right now, if I were just to go ahead and click on this hat as my target object, you know, it's not doing anything because I need to bind it, right? And if I bind it right now, well, that's fine, but it, now it's bound with this as a starting point. So it will now only deform this patch going forward if I were to like deform this hat some more. Let me just show you guys that by doing a simple deform. Okay, that's not quite what I was going for. That's kind of wonky, but you get the idea. It's, it's bound to that initial setup. So what we'd really need to do is like unwrap this hat surface so that it was flat, bind it, and then curve it back, which is, at least from my perspective right now, that's not super simple. I can't think of a, a quick and easy way to do that. Maybe there is, but basically the de facto way to do this is to actually combine these two approaches together. So let me just pull this guy off of my surface for a second. I'll turn off snapping. Oh yeah, one more keyboard shortcut that this took me a while to learn is you know, if I hit Z, that's only going in the Z direction, but if I hit Z again, then that's actually going in the Z direction relative to my object. So it's basically in the world space or the local object space. So if you hit any axis twice, Y, and then Y again, the second time will change to the local axis of that object, which is sometimes super convenient, right? Because in this case, I kind of want to pull this guy out from its current normal. So I can just hit G and then Z twice, and that'll perfectly pull it away from that surface. So real quick here, let me just show you what I was talking about with the deform. So let me get rid of this deform. So to do it, basically we need to have an intermediary in between, right? The thought process is shrink wrap is going to flatten whatever object you're trying to attach to the object and mesh deform will, will deform your object after you bind it. So what if we were to actually add a plane in between our patch and the hat where the plane is getting shrink wrapped to the hat that which is fine because the plane is already flat and then the patch is actually getting mesh deformed to the plane let me show you how this is going to work so i'm just going to scale this guy way down uh, i'm doing that in edit mode so that we're changing the actual size not the transform it's going to pull this guy out a little bit i'm going to rotate it again in edit mode and then let me actually just reset the orientation on this hat or on, on this patch. So we'll set it to zero and then the X can be 90. And then let's just put this guy up here. Awesome. So I'd like to put this patch pretty much right against this plane so I can go ahead and turn my snapping back on and snap to there. One problem though is with the snapping, it's currently snapping to the center, which is the center of everything. Unfortunately, that means that the patch will go through it. So what you can do instead is say snap to closest, which for some reason doesn't go in the center anymore. It's using like this top right or top left corner or one of these corners to snap. But at least what it's doing is it's snapping to the surface. Now it's snapping to the wrong side. Why is that? Right now it's just because the patch is closer to the other side. Um, all we're gonna do is temporarily turn snapping off. Let's move them this way a little bit, turn snapping back on and we should be a little bit better. So let's try to center that guy on there. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then what we can do is go ahead and we're gonna wanna parent it to this object, right? We're gonna, basically this is gonna become the new parent as we move this around, patch should too. So we can do the same thing as before. We'll choose the plane second, because that's gonna be the parent. Command or control P, object. And the reason why I didn't change over here is because we have a separate collection for the patch. So let's just move our plane into our patch. And now that will appear properly in here. It was still functionally the same before that. It just uh, was confusing because they're in two different collections. Okay, now I can move this plane around. So if we click on our patch and we add a surface deform, this is perfect, right? Because our, our plane hasn't been deformed yet. So what we can do is we can set the plane as the target and we can bind. And now let me just demonstrate by temporarily adding a modifier here on the plane itself. So simple deform. If we did like a bend, for example, or a twist, you can see it's actually twisting our um, patch along with it. Now, ignore the, the stitches. We have to remember the stitches are a whole separate object and we haven't done anything to try to make them also deform. But if we, if we just pay attention to the patch right now, you can see that's kind of working. Now with this simple deform, you have to make sure you get the orientation right. In our case, what we probably should have done is had, if I go back to edit mode, make this plane face upwards again. So let me just rotate it 90 and then we can go ahead and rotate it back. And the reason why I need to do that was just because uh, this simple deform usually works better if, if your underlying object is facing in the Z direction, right? If I put this back to zero, it's actually facing upwards. Uh, this is just a transform on top of that. The simple deform looks at the orientation of the mesh itself, not, not after the transform. Um, this looks crazy because I gotta go change 
unbind our patch. Um, let's change this to zero, rebind it. And guys, I was actually wrong. I just realized the reason why we weren't getting any bend here. Turn this back on in the X axis. Why is that not changing? Um, it's because we don't have enough geometry. <laughs> this is just literally one face with four vertices. So we need to basically add a whole bunch more faces and vertices. One of the easiest ways to do that is just to add a remesh modifier. Make sure we pull that up to the top so that it occurs first. I'm gonna temporarily turn off my simple deform. Let's just hide the patch and stitch for now. And to actually see what this is doing, what we can do is switch over to the wireframe view. As I decrease the voxel size, you can start to see what it's actually doing. It's actually adding all these faces in there, right? Let's make that 0 0.0005. Five. So now if we come back here and we start tapering, this still doesn't work because like I said, I was wrong. Um, really, we do want this, uh, if I change this back to zero, I think we do want the underlying mesh to truly be rotated in the X axis. And now if we turn this on, in this specific situation, this is bending how I wanted it to bend. If you're ever confused with the simple deform, why it's not bending the way you, you want, just go into edit mode and make sure your object is rotated in the correct orientation. You may need to experiment with a couple different orientations to get the result you want. So now if I turn that off, right, I need to turn that off because if I don't, okay, let's, sorry, let's quickly fix our patch. Patch needs to be 90 degrees again, right? If I bind it here, that's bound as if this was the the initial state. So now like I could I could turn this off and now it's going <laughs> to completely warp it the other direction, right? So what we actually want to do is unbind this, turn this off temporarily. Now we bind it. And now if we turn this back on, we're deforming. Uh, why is that so crazy? Well, this is where applying your scale comes back in. I've talked about this a little bit before, but in general, it's best practice to um, have the scale at one, meaning that uh, if you did scale it, you should apply it to your mesh or the other approach would just be to go into edit mode and always just change the mesh itself instead. In my case right now, let's go ahead and do control A, scale. That made this thing absolutely crazy. It's because we first forgot to unbind. If we unbind first, zoom back in, and then do this all over again, the whole song and dance, bind it now, we can finally get a bit of that deform that we were expecting. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, guys. I just wanna demonstrate how you would go about doing this. So, you know, things that we still need to do is we need our stitch to also deform. Unfortunately, in our situation, our stitch is actually a curve. If you watched my other video on how geometry nodes actually work under the hood, we actually built this stitch in geometry nodes where we can completely customize the spacing of the stitch, how many stitches there are, etc. And the best way we did that was actually by starting with just a simple curve like this. It is just a curve at the end of the day and then apply our modifier on top of that curve. Um, unfortunately though, what that means is with curves you don't have all the same modifier options. In particular, we don't have the option to surface deform like we do on meshes. So what you'd probably do right now is transform this curve into a mesh, right? Convert to mesh. And then once it's a mesh, you have the option to uh, basically surface deform the stitch to the patch and then the patch to the plane. And then finally we take this plane and we would add a, we get rid of our simple deform and we can go ahead and add a shrink wrap where we choose the hat surface as the shrink wrap. And this is looking all wonky because our plane is not rotated the right way. What we should be doing is turning snapping back on and making sure we align rotation to target again. And of course now our plane is rotated the wrong way according to this. So let's just take off this shrink wrap for a second happen to that guy which way do we need our normals facing upwards of course we'll unbind our patch let's just hide our patch and our stitch for a second here we're going further and further down the rabbit hole here guys okay so that's facing upwards now I snap again okay looks like that's rotating better so if I show our patch again our patch needs to once again rotate back to zero we're gonna bind it at that point. And now if we put this against our hat, that looks a lot better, um, but we're not shrink wrapping yet at this point, right? It's just uh, basically back to where we were originally. So now we can go ahead and enable our shrink wrap and that truly will shrink wrap it. You can see uh, if we look at our patch, that's now truly deforming along the edge of that hat. And the reason why I thought this was a bit of a better way is because like we're, we're very precise at this point, right? Honestly, in my opinion, it didn't really matter before because our patch was barely going into the hat. It's not something we'd ever really notice unless we were literally coming in from this angle. But you know, again, this is probably one of the most precise ways to do this if you truly need to deform the object, right? Of course, in the final render, we're not gonna want this plane at all. We just hide it. Uh, this one's viewpoint 
port, this one's rendered, so you'd have to hide both. And there you can see we're, we're actually getting that deform. So was it worth it? Not sure, that was a lot of work and definitely a rabbit hole, but maybe you learned something new. Um, since we have gone this far, let's fix our stitch too. As you can see, it's floating in the air because like I said before, we're, we didn't do anything to deform it. I kind of hate doing that operation I was mentioning, which converts to mesh because now that's it, right? It's a destructive operation. We don't have that flexibility to change our stitch anymore, you know, with all these nice controls that we created. If we wanted to later, we're kind of stuck. So not the most ideal in my opinion. Um, actually, let me just try something here. Okay, guys, I just did some experimenting and I think I actually have the perfect solution where we do not have to perform a destructive operation, meaning we don't have to um, apply our modifier. We can actually keep it exactly as it is and get this thing to deform as we want. Let me show you. I'm just gonna hide our plane real quick because that's kind of, actually, we can keep that for a second. We can isolate multiple objects by selecting all the objects we wanna isolate and then hit slash on our keyboard. This will give us a better view. So as we can see, of course, our patch is deforming, but our stitch is not. Here is the secret sauce. So if we go to our stitch, which again, remember this is a curve, add a modifier and then add the shrink wrap modifier. I tried this earlier and I kind of gave up on it because I was like, my, my initial intent was, okay, it's, it's shrink wrapping, which at the end of the day, this is just a curve. So actually that should be fine. We can just shrink wrap the curve, right? And then our geometry nodes should be applied on top of that. Well, if we had the shrink wrap down here, then that's applied after the geometry nodes, which is not what we want. If we put it before the geometry nodes, it still didn't seem to do anything. And, and this is where I gave up, right? So let me just choose this target of our patch, right? So if we put it before the geometry nodes, it just disappears. If I put it afterwards, it just does nothing. But turns out there is this special option here called Called apply on spline and what this will do is actually apply the shrink wrap on the splines points rather than the filled curve surface points which is kind of perfect because if I enable that what you can see here if I turn that on and off it's actually in fact shrink wrapping the curve itself so let me just get rid of my geometry nodes for a second it's this curve that's getting shrink wrapped to the surface now which is kind of perfect to allow us to, to do this non-destructively. Now, the next issue is if we turn our geometry node stitch back on, you'll notice that it's not perfect. Some of these stitches are in fact kind of right up against the surface. However, if we come down here, some of them are still kind of floating, right? You can see there, that guy's floating, those guys are floating, and then it kind of curves back down. So why is it doing that? Well, it's doing that because, and I'm in edit mode by the way, when you're shrink wrapping the spline itself, as a tooltip described to us, it's only applying the shrink wrap to the splines points, right? Which are these four points here that describe the curve, right? So essentially, since it's only these points that are getting shrink wrapped, we can expect the stitch that has to be right next to each control point to look really good. And then the stitches kind of, right, that one looks good, that one looks good, but the stitches in between the control points are floating in the air because nothing's really telling them to shrink wrap at that point, right? It's just the control points. So what we can actually do to solve this, thankfully, is add more control points. And if I, again, disable this for a second so you can see my spline, is there an easy way to add control points along an existing curve, right? Like if I hit this and hit E, I can add a new point and then I can do a lot of work to rotate this back the way I want it. But that's gonna be super tedious to try to keep this exact circle and extrude new points. Thankfully, if we highlight them all, there's a nice option here called subdivide. If I hit that, boom, immediately we have perfectly more points. Let me just disable my shrink wrap so you can see exactly what's going on there. We have more points and down here we could add as many as we wanted. I think in our case, let's try to leave that at two and enable our things again. In my opinion, we want as few as possible while still getting good results. So we just have to make sure that with two, the stitches in between are still properly spacing out. And I think that's looking pretty good. Of course, if our object was deforming a whole bunch more than this, like like extremely deforming, then we're, we would probably need to have more control points. But I love this solution because now we can continue to be non-destructive, right? If we wanted to change our stitch later, which um, I mean, let's go ahead and do that right now. I think our real stitch, if we count them, we have 14 stitches. So let's just increase the spacing between these so that we have 14. All right, I think that's 14 there. We'll increase our stitch size and our radius. And I think that's looking pretty close now. We can hide our plane and now we have a perfectly deformed patch and a perfectly deformed stitch or nearly perfect. Perfect enough for our use case right now. Yeah, I'm happy with this. I think in real life, our stitch is gonna be just a little bit thicker 
So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we can just go into edit mode, select it all, scale in the Z, the local Z axis, and just expand that out a little bit, about the thickness that we want. Maybe something like that. We'll need to go back and probably rebind this. So let's take the shrink wrap off. Let's um, go back to closest and then we're gonna center this guy. We need to do that because when we extruded it, it went into the plane a little bit, right? So we need to reattach it like that. Are we happy with that thickness? Hmm, I think we need to be just a bit thicker there. Oh, we actually just forgot to unbind. So let's unbind, how do we redo this again? The binding always trips me up. Okay, now do we like the thickness? I think that's pretty good there. So now we can uh, rebind that up, turn our plane shrink wrap back on, hide it, and we're pretty good. One last thing is this Travis Matthews logo. Um, let's just replace that with our own. Um, since we already have the rabbit hole syndrome logo on our patch, maybe this could be a, let's make this the YouTube logo. So to do that, I have conveniently prepared this time the YouTube logo in Figma. So I'm just gonna go ahead and export the PNG. Uh, width is 600, height is 422. Let's maybe, honestly, it's so small, that's probably fine, but let's just double it anyway. Export that. We'll just quickly create a folder called Assets and save it there. Coming back to Blender, let's uh, isolate that guy. We'll head on over to the Shading tab, and I'm gonna quickly add our YouTube logo onto here. Um, I'm gonna fast forward through this if you guys want to learn exactly how image textures work and all the different options within the shader uh, feel free to check out my other video called I wish I knew this before using image textures where we go into a ton of depth on how all of this really works under the hood so we'll head on over to the new assets folder and pull in our logo there how's that what do you guys think pretty simple I think that is good enough for now and it's actually much higher resolution than that previous Travis Matthews logo too. All right, oh, one more thing I just realized, our logo rotation is just a bit off here. So to do this, we're just gonna rotate in the Z, local Z direction, move them on over like that. And about there looks right. I think just to be super safe, let's go ahead and re rebind that in case that messed something up. Since it was just a rotation, it probably didn't matter, but worth checking. <clears throat> and now I believe we are ready to go. So before we go ahead and just blindly start animating this product video, let's come up with a bit of a game plan first. So I'm gonna try something new today. I'm gonna to create a new scene here. I'm actually gonna to try to use Blender to take some notes here. So the first thing we need to think about here is our story. And you might be thinking, story? Isn't this just like a 10 second ad, basically? Like, why do we need a story? And I would argue that, well, really everything has a story, right? Really our lives are made up of stories every single day from the tiniest little things to much bigger things, right? Think about it, if you were to create a presentation for your class or for your job, at the end of the day, you are telling a story, right? You're giving your audience context. What's the point of this presentation? You're giving them um, all the details within the presentation and then usually you're, you're finishing it up with conclusion and maybe some questions, right? Um, that's one example. Maybe you're a software developer and you're creating documentation for your software product or creating a readme file. In a sense, you're still telling a story you're giving context. Why did I create this piece of software? What's the benefit? Why would you want to use it? What have I tried before that didn't work that made me want to build this? And then how do you actually use the thing? And then finally, maybe how other developers can help contribute. So I would argue that any situation where you're actually communicating with somebody else, you are storytelling. So today with our hat product video, what is the story we're gonna tell? Now, of course you could take that literally and go all out and you know create this story of some kid who's been saving up money day by day, adding his quarters to his piggy bank, saving up for this hat that he's wanted his whole life. He goes to the store, looks at it through the window every single day as he walks to school. And then one day maybe his piggy bank gets stolen and you know he cries because he lost all his money and he can never buy his hat and then he goes back to school and maybe there's a talent show and he has this really awesome talent of doing a handstand backflip which that actually would be quite impressive and turns out the prize for the best talent in the talent show is this hat and he gets his hat after all and it's this emotional journey where 
where you're trying to sell your hat or whatever the purpose is. You could go that approach and you know, you can get the viewer as emotionally invested as you want. And sometimes that's worth it. Today, let's reel it in a little bit and we're gonna still tell a story, but it's gonna be a lot more surface level and simpler than that, but it is still a story. So what is our story? Well, let's map this out today. Essentially, when we create this video, we're gonna have a bunch of different shots if you will. So pretend that we're actually filming this hat in real life. We probably will have a bunch of different shots, you know, panning from one direction to the other. Are we zooming in and out? We, you know, a bunch of these different shots and it is only 10 seconds at the end of the day. So we gotta work within that restriction. So I don't know about you, but if I'm thinking of like a quote unquote epic product video, uh, I'm thinking of what are the qualities of something that you consider kind of like epic or, or badass? Well, I think there's an element of mystery in there, right? You know, perhaps you're like, oh, what, you know, what is this product? It is kind of like this suspense going on at the beginning. And then throughout that 10 second video, we obviously want to go into some of the details. You know, if it's epic, you know, maybe we have some cool shots in there, but at the end of the day, we actually also want to demonstrate what's cool about this product. So we should be featuring those unique details. And then at the end, we need to kind of pull it back. And I think in our case, show our target audience that final product, right? So let's map this out. We'll start off with some sort of mystery. And I think the best way to have mystery is like some sort of reveal, right? So just bear with me here. Let's call our first shot a reveal shot. Let me actually just make this a little bit smaller here. Perfect, so we got a reveal shot. And then we'll move on to our next shot. And especially when it comes to product videos, I think this is a very common pattern I've noticed, right? First, we're revealing the product, right? There's a sense of mystery, suspense, what is this thing? And then we need to um, pull our audience into that product. And I've found one of the best ways to do that is by doing like a zoom in shot, right? So let's write in zoom in, right? So we can like, we'll reveal our hat. We'll start zooming in, right? We're pulling our audience into this hat. Next, we can show our first detail shot, right? This is the meat of the story now. Why would you care about this hat? What, what are some features about it that make it unique? Let's do another detail shot and one more. Three is a nice number. It allows us to get creative showing three different features of this product. And now to end this story off, we want to pull back out of this whole thing, right? We revealed, we zoomed in, draw the audience into the product. What is it? We go through, whoops, we go through those detail shots, one, two, and three. And now let's step back. And I think the best way that I've found to do this is to do a zoom out. So you can visualize now these six different clips we're gonna need in order to create our product video. And I'm just gonna call this scene our planning scene. So our story is this, start with some suspense. You know, what is that thing? We want to bring that sense of anticipation in our audience, right? Storytelling is all about getting your audience to feel a certain way, basically, right? Okay, now that they have that sense of anticipation, how do we draw them in without quite revealing everything yet, right? So then we zoom in. Now let's start to give them what they want, right? Let's give them some detail. You know, as we're unveiling this product, we want to show off different little details of it, right? Think about like any Apple commercial you've ever watched. The first time they introduced the triple camera, right? It's, they have all these shots revealing that and going into detail on what that looks like. You know, the most recent one being the dynamic island. And so they start with a broader shot of the iPhone, right? Bringing into context, what are we talking about here? And then they, they zoom in and get into detail on that dynamic island. So for us, one of those details is most likely going to be our patch, right? What differentiates our hat? Well, it's our patch with our logo in the bottom right hand corner. So at least one of our detail shots should be focusing on that. Maybe the other ones could be including that, but also showing off the, the shape and the structure of our hat itself. If people are gonna buy this hat, say that was the end goal, then they're probably gonna wonder, okay, well, what, what does the back look like? Is it a snapback or is it just a, a like one size fits all scenario? You know, maybe they're wondering is, is the patch only on one side or is it on both sides, right? So we wanna kind of give them all these details to help them understand what this product really is. And then finally, once we've satisfied them, you know, their adrenaline has peaked as they're watching this and now we can kind of diffuse it and zoom out. You know, now now's the time when they relax a little bit and get a nice picture of the product as a whole, right? And I think a nice zoom out with the hat, maybe at a bit of an angle within the frame could do that nicely. At this point, we just have a camera and a lighting. And first of all, they're nowhere close to where we want them. And second of all, we're not done. We need more of a studio to get that final render we want, right? What do I mean by studio? Well, let's go ahead and add a backdrop, right? Without a backdrop, we have, first of all, nothing to reflect or diffuse the light or show any shadows. To help make this look real, we want to obviously have shadows. So we need a, first of all, a bottom plane to catch those shadows. And if we have the bottom plane, ideally we have a nice curve 
curved backdrop. I'm sure you guys have seen these before. The thing about 3D modeling and product shots is you often do pretty much just like you would do in real life. You know, in real life, you might have that backdrop that comes down from the ceiling and then curves into the floor so that you don't have that hard edge, right? You wanna have that nice curved diffused edge. So anyways, I'm sure this is not new for many of you guys. Let's go ahead and add a plane to our scene. In edit mode, let's just make that a little bit bigger. And then the best way I found to do this is if you select those two vertices and then that vertice, so just those three, you can extrude upwards if I hit Z in the Z direction. And I still have snapping on, which is why that's going crazy. So let's just turn that off. So extrude in the Z direction. And then um, we could either go ahead and try to bevel this right now so I can go command B or control B and then on my mouse wheel I can scroll up and that would bevel this out uh, what I'm gonna do instead though is since this is such a simple situation I prefer to be as non-destructive as possible so you can actually instead of doing that do a bevel modifier which by non-destructive I mean modifiers basically I prefer to keep things non-destructive because that gives me the most flexibility to alter things later on if I need to. so again this is doing exactly like we were doing a second ago except through a modifier let's make it that maybe 0.5, increase the segments. 15 looks pretty good for now. We can right click and shade auto smooth. I love this new option that uh, the latest Blender has added. I'm not sure if that's a 3.3 thing. One of the threes is when they released that. Before they just had shade smooth and then you'd always have to come into your object normals and set this auto smooth on, which in our case, it actually didn't really make a difference in this exact situation. But many of you guys are familiar with this. So what shade auto smooth does is automatically checks that off for you, which is super nice because you do that like 90% of the time. So we have a nice backdrop. Next, let's start figuring out our lighting. So with regard to render engines right now, the default is EV as every project is right now by default. I think in the end, we're going to want this to be cycles. I think that will just look a lot better and more realistic. So let's go, go to cycles for now so that we can plan out our lighting properly. First thing I'm noticing right now is our hat is not on the ground. So we're going to want to fix that. Unless, of course, you want a floating hat, but I don't want a floating hat right now. And perhaps this is actually a good opportunity to clean up our scene collections over here. So we last had this patch, which we actually imported from our last tutorial. Really, if we're going to, you know, say we ever want to move our hat around, right? ideally our patch will move with it. So maybe let's parent our patch to our hat real quick here. And I actually would just prefer to put them all inside the same collection, I think. So let's rename this from patch to hat or even just like product. You know, this is our product that we're showing off. And then our baseball cap can be inside product. And see what just happened there? It, uh, all of these other meshes came out of nowhere. Where do those come from? Well, they're actually all inside this baseball cap. Essentially all these different surfaces are parented to, I believe an empty is what they've done here. So when you're dragging something over, um, this confused me so much at first. It's actually only dragging over this top empty. Um, it doesn't automatically pull in all its children by default. So what you need to do is right click and say select hierarchy, which will select all of these. And then if we pull it into our product, then those will come in as we expected. This plane here was the one that we just created. This is kind of our backdrop. And let's pull that into our studio. And now we just have our good old baseball cap. And if we move that, everything moves together. Let's hide our plane because we don't want to show that uh, shrink wrapped plane there. And we're looking Gucci. So now we can go ahead and and lower this guy until he's touching. Um, actually, the rotation looks a bit funny there, doesn't it? Let's just correct that. Now we could try to use some fancy snapping, but in this situation, I don't think it's worth it. So I'm just gonna do this by hand. Perfect, so we got our hat on the surface. So now let's figure out our lighting. So we do have one light up here, far away from our hat. Um, I guess let's just bring that guy down here and bring it right in there. I don't want this to be a point light. I'd rather do an area light, which allows us to give it a very specific direction. So this is way too bright right now. Let's just pull down our power to something more reasonable. And maybe let's make this a disc light so that it's it's less boxy. I want it to be circular. You can probably come down even more on the brightness. And I'm purposely bringing this guy right in here, right? So that we can um, really accentuate the uh, shadows on this hat, make it a little bit more dramatic, which is our goal for this video. In terms of positioning lighting, this is kind of something that you get better at over time. Personally, I like just switching between the different views and then rotating accordingly. That often helps. So between one, three, and seven on your numpad, one being your front, three being your side, and seven being your top view, you can kind of quickly position and rotate your light as you need. Since we are showing off our patch, probably we want this guy featuring that to some extent. Though at the same time, we do want to have that shadow on the patch too. So let's just zoom in there and see how this looks. 
our camera angle matters too here, right? Now throughout creating this video, we're actually gonna have many different camera angles, but you know, at least a couple of them are gonna be like those featured shots, right? So we want those ones to look really good. Like when we zoom out at the very end, that's gonna be like, hey, here, here's the product. This is the final thing. We probably want that one to look as good as possible. One thing I forgot to do that I would typically do in this scenario is turn my world color all the way off. Um, by default, it's got a little bit of strength there. And since I want full control of the lighting here, I think I'm gonna turn that right off. It's gonna make it look a lot more dramatic in this situation, but if we don't want it to be quite this dramatic and make it a little bit more subtle, that's fine. But now we can add that secondary light ourselves and have full control over where it's positioned. Think of this AKA to, okay, you're in a studio within your office or your house and you're taking a product shot and you have all your lighting perfect. Perhaps you wanna be in a blackout room where you can actually turn off all the lights to that room completely and use strictly your exact studio lighting, right? Same idea. So let's actually do that. Let's add one more light here just to help my computer so it's not struggling. I'm gonna go back to solid mode. There's our light, scale that down a little bit. And this, this one can be a little bit more faint, I think. If we go into the lighting properties, I think that's a little bit too much. If we pull it down to zero, we can see what we had before. So let's just slowly creep that up so that we can add just a tiny bit more ambient lighting until we're happy with it. Yeah, not bad. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let's try it out for now and then we can see how it goes. Um, we're going to need to get our cameras set up. So cameras have always been a fun one to, to deal with in Blender. For those who are on the newer side, uh, you have a couple different options. So first of all, how do I go to my camera? Um, I hit zero on my keyboard. Turns out the default camera is way up here. Of course, if you as soon as you start changing views there, you're, you're brought out of it until I hit zero again. Now, one thing you could do is take this and go G, you know, Z or Z, and it would I could pull that right in there until I kind of get it where I want, right? G, Z, and try to zoom in like that. But one of my favorite ways to actually control the camera is by coming over here into the view tab. And then there's actually this option that allows you to lock the camera to your current view, which means now I can actually scroll in and you know rotate around and pan and do everything that I would normally do with a regular view. And my camera will actually follow that, which is at least for me, like one of the most useful ways to control your camera. By the way, you just have to always be careful about when this is checked, because sometimes you forget, you know, you get things lined up perfectly and then you, <laughs> you forget that it's checked and then you go to change your view and then suddenly you just actually rotate your camera. So you be careful about that. But anyways, I use this, this feature so often that I actually added it as a quick favorite, meaning that you can just hit Q on your keyboard and that's available there now. So I find that super handy, right? Cause now I can just go zero. Oh, I don't quite like this, you know, Q, lock it in, adjust it a tiny bit, Q, turn it off and you have that full control. So I enjoy that. Another option I was gonna show is if you come in here real quick and you can actually go, so I'm not on my camera anymore, just on my regular viewport and I can actually go view cameras set, oh, sorry, view, align view, align active camera to view. <laughs> there we go, the struggle is real. So if I click this now, suddenly the current view that I have becomes the active camera, which is another really convenient way to set your camera. Now the scale of the camera is kind of big, so let's just pull that down. So there's our camera. I'm just gonna tweak this a little bit. And this is where it starts to become quite the creative process, right? The best things in life, in my opinion, are those things where you can be both creative, but also technical, right? We can be technical in the sense that we are able to fully understand the tools that we're using to build what we're trying to build in this case blender if we're technical we understand all the different options and how to be as precise as we want to be but you know there's also creative side too that technicalities alone aren't going to get you on the flip side creativity without those technical abilities restricts the options available to you right so moving along here i think i like you know if this is going to be one of our shots um, I kind of like maybe something like this, right? Because up here, you don't get the underside of that hat. So we're, we're losing some detail and probably there, we're losing some nice shadows there too. Um, we don't want it too straight on. We're losing detail, like it's not clear. This is a hat even if you come at it at the wrong angle. This is pretty clear, but still not the best. I think these angled 45 are the best and let's get a little bit of that underside of the hat there too, right? At this point, we're trying to bring in as much detail as we can. Let me check out cycles real quick looking pretty decent. So at this point, even if we weren't gonna create a video, this is actually looking not bad, right? Um, one thing that is bugging me is actually the, the brim on this hat. Looks like it's floating over there. Usually this is the heaviest part of the hat. So maybe we should rotate that out a bit so that that part's 
actually resting there. So let's just make sure we're not locked. We are locked, let's take that off. And then we can come here at the side angle, grab our hat and maybe let's rotate it this way just a little bit. Yeah, I think that's even on both sides, more or less. And now again, we can just hit zero, come back here, check out cycles. Okay, we're good. So if you guys were like, screw it, this is all I wanted, just a nice render photo, then there you have it. <laughs> you can take off now, have fun. But the intent of this tutorial is to actually create that product video. So let's keep moving on that. One more thing, actually, we never gave our floor and backdrop a color. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's call it backdrop. And right now it's white by default. I think I want to pull that down to black, right? The backdrop of black almost makes this hat stand out a little bit better, right? You know, especially these edges over here. These really stand out on top of that black background. Again, going with our more suspense, epic vibes, I think this greater contrast will tell our story a little bit better. I'm not super happy with the lighting anymore though, so let's go ahead and tweak that. And our area light got put into our product collection by accident. Let's move it over to our studio. And yeah, I think let's pull this one up a little bit. This was kind of our ambient light. I don't know, what do you guys think? I'm trying to add as much dimension as possible to this shot, right? So highlights here in the center around our logo, um, starting to get a little bit darker on the edges, just to really show off the shape of this hat. Now, one thing we maybe could do is add a light behind it for backlighting. Yeah, actually, I don't mind that at all. I think that really helps create more contrast on these edges, right? When you're doing product shots, that's one thing you really want to try to do is, unless you're intentionally trying to fade out one of your edges, you want to add your lighting in such a way that you can specifically see the edges of your product, right? Now, one thing I don't like is all the light leaking underneath the hat. It looks kind of freaky, like, why is there a light in there? What can we do? By the way, one, one thing that can help here is if we pull in a secondary view, I can use this one to help move my lighting around, and then this one can be my final camera shot. All right, I think we're doing pretty good here. It would be nice just to get a tiny bit of light under the brim there because we're losing a lot of information in there. Is that enough to do the job? We are getting a little bit of light under that brim now. I don't love this reflection here. I'd rather not have that if I could. Can actually turn that down just a little bit. I just want enough that I can see the bottom side of the brim, but it doesn't need to be so intense. Awesome. I think we got the perfect amount of subtlety there. So before we jump into our animation, there's one more thing we need to figure out first our music. Now, there's lots of opinions out there on what's the best workflow for creating these videos, right? Do you start with your song and use that as inspiration for your video itself? Or do you create your video first and then kind of just line that up with a soundtrack that you find down the road? And my answer to that is, it depends. There have definitely been situations out there where video designers have heard a specific soundtrack and just got super inspired. That actually helped them come up with their video in the first place. And in that situation, most certainly let that music track uh, inspire the rest of your video. In other situations, maybe that's less important, right? Maybe it's more of a background track or even if it was a somewhat timed out, planned out video along with your music, um, sometimes you can get away with doing it afterwards. So in our case, we knew from the beginning that we wanted to have kind of like this fast paced video 10 seconds long again the quote-unquote epic vibes and so we've already planned out our scenes accordingly right if you recall we have our reveal zoom in detail one two and three and then a zoom out and to us this was the most important thing right now this doesn't mean we can just choose any old song we're gonna go through that right now and do our best to find a, a track that can match this fast-paced flow that's gonna be super important but I'd say this is a situation where we kind of knew what we wanted first anyways if we had heard a track first perhaps that could have definitely inspired this but I just want to point out that you could definitely go either way on that workflow. In this case, I think we're going to basically need to introduce our track midway through our workflow. And the main reason why, honestly, is because I need to know how long each of my shots is going to be, right? So for example, we're going to have a reveal shot, zoom in, detail one. Probably a lot of these are going to be pan shots, right? Zoom in, zoom out. So literally how long is each of these clips going to be? We want this to be about 10 seconds total divided by six. So maybe just over one and a half seconds each, approximately. I mean, that could work and we could plan around that and it would, it would probably end up working pretty good in the end. But ideally at this point in time, we do have an understanding of what that music track is gonna look like because 
what I want to do is I want these shots to go exactly within the beat of that video and very intentionally change shots as patterns within that song change too. Synchronizing the video to the music like this I think can really enhance that adrenaline epic feeling, right? So today I'm gonna to pull my music from a platform called Artlist. I just wanna point out that at this time I am not sponsored by Artlist at all. So right now at this point in time, I am choosing this just because I have used this in the past and I know there's a good chance we can find the music that we want for this specific scenario. But of course there are many other music platforms available and I'm not gonna get into all the differences right now. But I will say at this point in time, find one that works for you and you can hopefully use the same process that I'm about to go through right now. So if we scroll down, you can actually already start looking at some of these tracks without even uh, signing up. So let's head on over to the Epic tab. And with regard to genre, I'm, I'm definitely having like a hip hop vibe in my head. You know, of all these different genres, I feel like hip hop can really mesh well with the overall theme that we're going for. So yeah, you can go ahead and give these a listen. So there's one. Honestly, maybe a little bit too intense for what I'm going for. Let's keep going through here. Stop that. Stop that. I'm not getting that same energy that I want with that one. Maybe epic isn't quite what we want. If we go back to mood, maybe something like powerful could be good for us. And when we're looking at these waveforms too, right? In my mind, I want something that just starts right away, right? Our video is only gonna be 10 seconds long, right? So if there's too long of an intro, then by the time it gets to the real meat of the song, our clip's over, right? Which means really the only way to use those ones would be to crop them ourselves, at which point now we have to start rearranging and recomposing songs ourselves, which isn't super ideal. I mean, none of these are gonna be 10 seconds long, so ultimately we're gonna have to do that regardless. But you know, if we can minimize that, that'd be ideal. So like this one looks pretty good because it, it, it starts the song right away versus something like this above it. Right, lots of time spent on that intro. For the victory lap though. Whoa, whoa. They ain't never seen nothing like Whereas let's give this one a go. Honestly, guys, I love that one. I think that's probably perfect for our scenario here because, again, it started at the very beginning. I can't rewind right now. Uh, when you log into this, by the way, once you do create an account, I believe you can create an account for free and you only start paying once you actually need to use the tracks. But when you log in, you get a player down here. Let me just do that for you. Here we go. So I've logged in. Now I get this player so I can actually rewind. If we pull back to the beginning here. I can't take no loss. Right, so within like less than two seconds, we're already right into the song. And of course, this is definitely where a lot of that creativity comes in, right? What I will say is, at least for me, as you're going through each of these songs, you like definitely go down rabbit holes, right? I'm definitely embarrassed to say how much time I've spent on these songs. Sometimes just clicking through them, it almost becomes addicting, right? But what you're doing is as you're listening to each song, you're, you're trying to visualize in your head what your video is going to look like, right? So, you know, do what you need to do, close your eyes. Uh, but really you want to be visualizing your final product as this music is playing and like tap into that feeling, right? How do you actually feel as the song is playing? Like, is this matching what you're going for? Can you like clearly see in your head a product video like in sync with this song? You know, we're going for that epic vibe. Does this feel epic, you know? I can't take no loss, I don't even know what it costs. So there we're at 10 seconds already and it just repeated, right? So again, like we will need to do something to this track or if we're gonna go with this one to end it early, but I think everything else is perfectly good about it. So let's go ahead and use 
no loss by Canon. And just to be clear, I do have a subscription to Artlist, so that's how I'm able to include this in my video today. Without that license, you would not be able to use it, right? So now that we've decided this is a song, what I want to do is picture each shot, right? You know, like I said before, I want to synchronize our video to the beat of this song. So we need to essentially, if we can, roughly time out each segment or, or each shot, right? So to quickly and roughly figure out those timings, the best way I think to do this is actually just to go ahead and pull up our video editor. Now, the video editor that I'm going to be using today is DaVinci Resolve. For those who don't know, DaVinci Resolve is actually free to use and fully featured. Their business model is basically they give you additional features if you pay for the full version, but compared to almost every other quote unquote freemium software I've seen out there, DaVinci Resolve free version basically has everything that you could possibly need to do your video editing. It's just those very tedious things that you or, or super fancy effects that you may want that you need to pay for the full version for. And, you know, if you spend so much time in here that you're wanting to use those features, probably it's well worth the cost of the software, right? So feel free to follow along today with DaVinci Resolve. This is one of the best video editing software I've used recently. I actually used DaVinci Resolve today to make these videos. I used to use Premiere Pro at one point, but back then I was seeing that a lot of people were actually switching to DaVinci Resolve. I want to learn what features it had and what it was all about. I ended up really liking the ergonomics of it. And at that point in time, I was still early enough into my video editing that I wasn't stuck to the premier ways, if you will. Um, I know a lot of people still don't switch just because it's just too much work. You know, you've you spent years using certain keyboard shortcuts and certain patterns that you'd be learning to walk again, basically. And, and, and I get that, that's totally understandable. But for those who are new, DaVinci Resolve is definitely a good choice. Now it isn't open open source, right? It is, like I said, free. Um, if you're looking for open source option, unfortunately today I haven't been able to find too many good ones. I mean, Blender itself, fun fact, has a video editing tool in it. If you scroll on over here and you come to the video sequencer is what they call it. But honestly, I haven't had the best luck with it. In my opinion, not the same caliber as a proper video editing tool like this. Anyway, so let's quickly pull in our soundtrack. So I downloaded that. I'm just going to drag that into my media library here, and then I can pull that into my timeline which it'll create for me and then we can go ahead and play this so essentially what i want to do is i want to break up my scenes by the beat of the song so right here that's obviously going to be a break and then if you're familiar with music theory like at all this song has four beats in a measure so essentially i want to create a break every four beats so there's a break Know what it costs, huh? I hit the, huh? I hit the ground. I think there's a break. I'm gonna go off, yeah. Hit the ground. Hit the ground. I'm gonna go off, yeah. I can't take, yeah. I can't. So there we go. I think those are our cuts. Now, I didn't actually have to cut these for my final video, but I just wanted to really show you guys. Each clip we're gonna be basically aligning our, our videos to. Now, essentially we could just say each clip could be about the length of this. They should all be the same length since they're all four beats within the same song. Realistically, our video clips are gonna be slightly shorter than this because we're gonna to have to transition between each one unless we just do a hard clip. So we can deal with that later. I'd say transitions and stuff is something we can worry about much later on. That's not something we necessarily need to plan out now. But the reason why I wanna do this is so that I would know in fact how many frames basically I'm gonna to need to create each shot. So so the first shot is going to be this basically right on the two second mark. So first shot, I should probably make around two seconds, then around 315. So what's that? Oh, sorry, guys. Oh, no, that's right. Two seconds, right? This this last part is actually the frame number. So you can see right here, it goes to 24 and then it skip and then it jumps up to three seconds. And that's because right now our project is set to 24 FPS, which I think is a good frame rate for this scenario. So we can stick to 24 FPS. So that's why right here we're at between here and here we've gone one second and 15 frames. <laughs> so more or less 24 plus 15 frames is essentially 40 frames. Whereas the first one was two seconds, which would have been 48 frames, 48 frames, and then about 40 for each one after that. And then of course, we're gonna have to do our outro. And I don't know if that's gonna be 40 or 48. We could probably make it 48 just to be on the safe side. I mean, we can make all these way longer too, but I think we wanna get pretty close to the, the right number of frames because first of all, we don't wanna be spending time rendering more frames than we need to. Uh, that always takes quite a bit of time. And then also if we make it like, way too long then that makes it difficult 
for us to capture the right shot within each segment, right? So let's go for 48 frames on the first reveal clip, right? This was going to be a reveal. And I can already see this being perfect, right? You can, you can, you can picture in your head as this part's going, you know, we're going to reveal our product and then boom, let's get right into it, right? So back to Blender, let's start animating. And as we're animating, let's actually just take a look here. I'm going to go to this view um, just because on my current computer cycles isn't the quickest. So let's just go to um, our material preview, which if you've been following some of my other videos, you'll know that this material preview is actually using Eevee under the hood. Um, even if you're using cycles here, this preview is actually rendered with Eevee, which is kind of cool. So we've got our, our first camera shot there. What I might do is actually just leave this camera here as like a still because maybe down the road, who knows, for a thumbnail or for something, I may want to have that still camera shot. And if I were to convert this to a video camera and animate it, then I it's, it's harder for me to capture this. So I'm just gonna keep this here and call it maybe my camera dot still dot. Usually you use dots to like separate the hierarchy of your of your naming. Now if I were to have multiple stills, I could increment them one, two, and three. Actually Blender will do that for me if I shift D. You can see they automatically added a, a two for me. So I'm gonna call it still one. I think it might be nice to separate our cameras into their own collections. I think that might just be a little bit cleaner here since we're we're gonna have multiple cameras. So let's talk about that actually real quick. We pull up our timeline and maybe, yeah, actually I'm just gonna pull my animation tab up here. Uh, these workspaces are nice. Like I see so many people just completely disregard these and build their workspaces themselves, which is completely fine, totally reasonable. But in my opinion, they I don't know, I, I think Blender's done a good job of creating workspaces that have really good defaults. So I'm gonna use the animation workspace. Um, you can see what they're doing here. They're actually putting my final view here on the left-hand side, and then I can use this view to kind of play around and, and animate stuff. I like that. So let's change this back to our material preview mode. And so we are gonna talk about cameras. Why do I wanna have multiple cameras? Well, at the end of the day, you don't actually need to have multiple cameras. You could animate every single shot with one camera, right? So like our original plan, we're gonna have a reveal shot. We'll, we'll come up with something there. We're gonna have a zoom in, right? So, you know, the camera's gonna like slightly zoom in at some point on this hat. Maybe we have some close-up detail shots, you know, with our patch and it's panning across. Uh, maybe we do some cool, funky shots, whatever, we can figure it out. If we use the same camera, then we actually have to like animate that camera's position and then jump it to the next spot and animate that and then jump it to the next spot, which is totally like doable. It's just more work. And honestly, it's a little bit more tedious to work with it at the end of the day. Another thing we might want to do is if we have multiple cameras, we can actually go into the camera settings and change things like focal length, etc. which um, like maybe for a very specific shot, we want to be using a very specific camera focal length, right? This is true in the real world too. We might use two different cameras for two different shots. Like this is done all the time. So creating that parallel with a real world, it actually makes a lot more sense to create multiple cameras. Of course, we could again, still use one camera and like animate our focal length, but again, now that's even more work for us, right? So let's let's uh, let's use multiple cameras and I'll show you guys how to do that. So I was gonna split these out into their own collections. I'm gonna create a collection called still cameras just for my like still shots. I'm gonna toss that guy there. I'm going to create another collection called video cameras and I'm going to actually just duplicate my still camera here for a second so that I can pop into my video cameras and this will be my video camera number one. And honestly, it doesn't really matter which order we do this in. Like the way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna create a different camera for every single shot. So back to our planning page, right? For each of these, reveal, zoom in, detail one, two, and three, and zoom out. I'm gonna create a different camera for each of these. So first question, how do we switch between cameras? Like in our timeline, and in just the viewport right now. Like if I hit zero, which camera am I on? Well, if I take my second video camera and I like move him up, let's just say temporarily, you can see that that's actually not the camera I'm putting, it's going to the bottom one, which is my still camera. How do I make it switch to my new camera? Well, over here on the right hand side, you can see that this camera icon is highlighted. This is actually indicating the active camera. So if I come down here and click on that now on my video camera, you can see it's now jumping to that other camera. And you could have done the same thing here under scene. You can go ahead and change the current camera. You can only have one active camera per scene. So that's doing the same thing, but this is just a convenient shortcut there. 
And how do we animate between cameras in the timeline here? I'll show you that in just a second. But first, let's figure out how to do our reveal shot, right? Number one, we're gonna do a reveal. So I'm gonna hit Q for my handy tandy quick favorites. I'm gonna lock the camera so that I can now move this guy around a little bit. And I'm thinking for our reveal, like we could have a different, couple different options, right? Maybe we're, we're up here at the top looking down. I'm just gonna do this very roughly to start. You know, maybe it's off screen and like your start is revealed. You know, that's one option. Don't know if I'm in love with that. Um, ideally, I like to get more of, you know, that hat look in there. So again, we could be out of scene here and come in. We'd have to make our backdrop bigger, otherwise we're gonna get some weird lighting right here on the edge. But I'll just show you guys one cool approach that I've experimented with in the past. And, and I've liked the results of it quite a bit. Feel free to use your own creativity and just play around with different options. Um, this is never quick, guys. Like, expect this to take some time. Like, creativity isn't quick, right? The number one killer of creativity is is stress and timelines, right? <laughs> so, you know, if you're planning to think outside the box, definitely give yourself lots of time to do this. You know, I've tried many things that didn't work and this was one that, that just did. So let me show you. I'm gonna toggle out of this lock to camera for a second here. And what I'm gonna do is actually add a new mesh to my scene. I'm gonna add a cube, which is way too big right now. Let's maybe try that. And I'm going to move on over to here. And let me kind of show you what my game plan is. So if I come back to my camera, and lock the camera again. You can kind of see what I'm going for here. We're gonna maybe come down here just a little bit more. And what I wanna do is like kind of start with it like kind of hidden behind this block. And then I'm gonna move the camera in and reveal this hat. So I'm, I'm intentionally not coming this far because I don't want, want to get outside of this block. I mean, technically <laughs> nothing stops me from just fixing my block, right? Let's do that, okay. So now I have that full freedom. So yeah, I think I'm gonna do a panning shot and I'm just gonna pan over like this and and kind of reveal our hat. And I'm, I like to try to keep our rule of thirds as much as we can here, right? So I don't want this hat in the center. I want it to kind of be in that third. So maybe we start start like that. You can you can see a, little, a tiny little sliver of it and then we'll kind of do a reveal. So by the time this shot's done, we actually end up in that third. So what I usually like to do is actually start with my final, like start with the end of my shot, which I think is where I want right about there and um, we can go ahead and keyframe that. And remember, we wanted 48 frames for this first shot. We could just round it up to 50 maybe. Might make it a little bit easier. Um, we do start at one, not zero. So it'd be one through 50. And then my next camera would have to start at 51. So let me add my cube to my studio. That's part of my studio. And real quick, our let's just double check to make sure this is 24 fps if we come on over to our output properties there we can't see that the framer is in fact 24 fps i believe that's the default for blender so that actually works perfectly but that was important for us to double check first right so let's go ahead and create a keyframe for this so with our video camera selected i'm going to pull up our sidebar this arrow or n on your keyboard and to create a keyframe we would just hover over the transform that we want to keyframe in this case since we're doing a pan i only care about the locations so i can hit uh uh, I can either right click and say insert keyframe or the shortcut is I on your keyboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit I. And you can see down here in my dope sheet, this has created a keyframe for me on 50 for that location, which is perfect. So now what I can do is I can come back here to our first keyframe and I can move our camera over. Now, this isn't that great practice because I might screw this up. Like I really only wanna move it exactly left and right, or you could see the X axis local to this camera. So to do that instead, I'm just gonna select this camera, hit X on my keyboard. Oh, sorry, not X, G and then X, um, and then X again to go on the local X axis of this camera. So like we said before, we were kind of around here is where we wanted to start, maybe something like this. Now be careful, right? Orange means that this has changed, but I haven't created a keyframe for it yet. So I'm not done. If I don't create a keyframe now, then this shot will be forever lost. So let's go ahead and hit I on a keyboard again. And now you can see it's gone ahead and created some keyframes there. So as I animate between them, we are getting a good old pan shot. Now, the thing about pan shots is they're typically linear. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we head on over to our graph editor, you can see that by default, it's actually easy in these, right? We have these curves available. By the way, the way I zoomed in just then as I hit A on my keyboard to select all points and then dot on my numpad. This is what I love about Blender is it's the same shortcuts no matter whether you're in your graph editor or your actual viewport or your geometry nodes or your shaders or anything. It's all the same controls, which is really nice. So once you learn it once, you're good to go. Anyways, 
to my point, pan shots are typically linear, meaning that they're not curved like these ones are. I'll just emphasize this by looking at this one. This is truly curved, right? Um, my Y location. So to fix this, you can hit T on your keyboard, which will um, allow you to adjust the interpolation. And I'm going to change it from, right now it's on Bezier. I'm gonna change it to linear. And you can see what that's done here. It's actually just made this a linear animation, which is exactly what we want because for pan shots, that's what we're going for, right? We don't want that easing. Now, there's one more thing I like to do this shot that I think would enhance that mystery and anticipation, which is to actually start with this blurred. So like intentionally set the depth of field to not be focused on this hat. And then as we're pulling in, we're kind of, it's almost like we have auto focus on maybe in a way where we're, we're kind of focused more on this block first, but as we're revealing this hat, it actually, the hat becomes in focus, right? And that's actually quite easy to do in Blender. So if we still have our video camera selected come over to our camera and then under depth of field we can turn that on and again what I like to do is st start with our final product so right now you can see our camera is not in focus we can adjust it by either setting this distance or selecting an object to focus so in an ideal world we just choose this picker click on our hat and now our hat's in focus perfect that worked however we actually need to animate between being focused and out of focus so if we're locking our focus to this hat it's always going to be in focus so we have a couple options here uh, one option would be to manually try to figure out what this focal distance is and then animate between it um, another option i've seen people do before is actually create like an empty and then set the empty as the target of the focal distance and then actually just animate the empty from where you want to focus so we could have one focus point here and then animate its position to the hat so that's a pretty clever way to do it i'm just gonna keep it super simple and i'm gonna just do it by hand just for simplicity today and there is a measuring tool in blender over here so what we can do is actually just uh, measure from our camera to our object we can see we're basically 1.9 almost exactly to the edge of this hat where we want to focus 1.9 meters so let's just make it 1.9 meters if you want to be super precise i would go with the empty approach but i think this will be good enough for now so if we set that to 1.9 our hat is in focus and we can always just compare this eyeball it too if i click on that looks almost identical so i think that's pretty good what we can do is just like we did on our transform location we can actually just right click and go insert keyframe or hit i and then we'll come back to the beginning and we'll set this depth of field i'm going to pull it right in i want this box to be in focus so that's going to be maybe around 0.5, 1, where is it? Around there, 0.75. And here we go again. I forgot to apply it, right? So 0.75, it was orange. I didn't create a new keyframe. Now I got to hit I, otherwise that will be lost. Now we can see as we're revealing, we will actually start to focus on that hat. Now we need to decide what kind of interpolation we want for our depth of field distance right now you can see by default again it's curved and to do that we're getting pretty precise at this point so i'm going to go back to cycles and see if i can kind of get a, a vibe of how this looks in cycles first so i mean my cycles render isn't that fast so it's a little bit trickier but we can see at this point it's pretty blurry which is good around here we're still quite blurry which i'm okay with and then when we get about here it starts to really come into focus so i think this is actually pretty good i'm okay with this curve and even with ev my frame rate is extremely slow right now yeah let's give that a go i think that's pretty good so we can move back into our dope sheet and to do that we can come back here or the keyboard shortcut is just control tab to do that and i actually have a keyframe here for my annotation i'm just gonna get rid of that Okay, so next we need to move on to our second shot. So this is where we apply the multi-camera trick. So first of all, we need another camera. We'll do Shift D, hit Escape, just to leave it in the same position for now. Blender already called it Video 2, which is perfect. And of course, we need to make sure that now this Camera 2 is our active camera, so we can click on that. And I can go ahead and lock the camera again and now move this around to a new position. So what I'm going to propose for our second shot, if you recall, our second shot is a zoom in. So we just finished our reveal. Now we need to zoom in on our product. So coming back here, I'm going to propose that we zoom into the product from a bird's eye view. I think that would look the best, right? Let me show you not that. We could have this as our, as our next shot, just on a side profile, right? And animate zooming in like this, right? Coming into the product, pulling our audience into this quick video. The 
reason why I don't like this is because it's almost too similar to our last shot, right? So if you can imagine we're cutting shots and first we get the reveal and then if we're just right here and then we start zooming in, you know, like this, that's not enough difference, I think. In my opinion, we only have 10 seconds to work with here, right? So we want to maximize the different angles and variety that we have. Um, another option could be this front, but I'm not a huge fan of the front just because we don't get a good profile and it doesn't really show us the, the object that we're displaying here. And this is very specific to, to our hat, right? For whatever product you're creating, this front profile may perfectly well be the best shot. But if we can come in here from a bird's eye view, you can kind of picture this idea where first we just revealed it, you know, our camera focused in on the hat. Then we could start up here and just start zooming in like this, right? So at this point, the audience knows, yes, okay, it is a hat because it was just revealed. So now we kind of get that bird's eye view contour of the hat and the zoom in effect will pull them into this clip, right? So I'm gonna do this. Now this is where I do like to be exact, so it's pretty easy to do with the transform. You can um, just, first of all, we can reset our rotation. It's pretty easy to know too, because you just look at the ones that are really, really small, and then you say, okay, those should probably just be zero. So let's make that zero. Let's make this one zero as well. And then I can just pan in front there. And then my last one's 86.6. To me, that's saying this should have been 90. And then now we have that straight on. And actually, you know what? I don't think I necessarily want that to be 90 actually, because if you can see the hat, is pointing that way. So, well, we have two options. We can either rotate our camera just a little bit so that's more straight on sideways, or we could rotate our hat itself. Let's figure out which, which option's better, let's see. So if we rotate our hat ourselves, we're risking ruining our other shot. Let's go back to our last camera. I don't think we lost anything in that shot. Um, if anything, we got a little bit more underneath that brim, which is probably better. Our still shot is kind of ruined, but we can quickly fix that guy without too much work. Pull it back a little bit like that. I think it's better that our actual hat is at the right angle. Okay, so with this second camera selected, you'll notice that since we duplicated the first camera, we actually inherited all the keyframes. That's something we definitely don't want, except I don't want to just delete these because if you recall, as soon as I change my frame of the timeline, it's going to reset back to where it was before, right? And since I had these keyframes before, it's going to reset to the old camera's position so you got to be really really careful um, I make this mistake all the time and I get frustrated because I do all this work to line up my perfect shot and then they get erased so first thing I'm gonna do is actually just insert a keyframe here just so I don't lose that and then I'm gonna go ahead and select the first keyframes and just hit X to delete those um, with this camera we don't actually care about depth of field anymore I'm not gonna animate the distance so I'm just gonna go ahead and delete that keyframe and I can I can actually just even uncheck depth of field altogether this is a whole separate camera, right? So I'm I'm safe to do that. And I think I want all these keyframes on 51 because my old one ends at 50, right? So there's no point of starting at 50 if I'm only gonna see this clip in 51. So the next question is, how do we change cameras within our timeline? Well, it turns out Blender has a mechanism for this and the mechanism is called markers. Within the Blender dope sheet, you can create markers on your keyboard. That would just be M. So it, as long as you're selecting the right frame, I'll choose our new 51 frame and hit M. And by default, it just labels the marker frame number. I can hit F2 to, to change that name. But instead of changing the name, um, what you can actually do is you can bind cameras to the markers, which is perfect. So if we go back to marker one and change our camera back to our first camera, I wanna bind my first camera to this marker. And to do that, all I have to do is select our marker, hit on Mac is Command B, uh, probably Control B on Windows. And what that's actually doing is this one here. So if you come down to marker, bind camera to marker. So this will bind whatever camera you have selected to the marker, right? Since I has two selected, it actually bound that, which is not what I want. I want the first one bound. So that will bind it there. Come back to my second marker. And by the way, if I'm not on a marker, it'll just bind it to the current spot. So technically I didn't even need to create these markers in the first place. I just want to show you guys what's going on and that you have the option to bind them. But uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and select this one, bind that. And now you can see as I come through the timeline here, as soon as I hit 51, boom, I'm now switched over to my second camera. This is absolutely perfect for us because now we can go ahead and mark out each of our clips or each of our shots rather, and basically bind a camera to each of those shots. So the first one was 50. I think going forward, we can make each one 40. So that will end us at 90, which means our next clip is gonna start at 91. So we could just go ahead and create markers for each of these. M on the keyboard is a marker. I'm gonna go another 40. 
90 plus 40 is 130. So then my next one's gonna be at 131, 171. So that's our zoom in, detail one, detail two, 2 211, detail three. And then we need to do our zoom out, which maybe let's just do 50 frames just to be safe or uh, 250. Yeah, let's do 50 frames just to be safe. So let's go um, change the frame length. We can come down to output properties and then we have our frame range and right now it's 250. We can change that to 260. And the other place you could change this is if you go to your timeline, here's another place where you have access to that. And now we that will be our last one there. So as long as I got this right, let's take a look. We have one, our intro, reveal, zoom in, detail one, detail two, detail three, zoom out. So we have our six shots. And it looks like I accidentally hit Command B instead of marker on these guys. Whoops, clear that marker, delete that marker. So we'll go M and then where was the other one? 171, I believe, M. All right, so maybe the best thing to do right now is actually just let's create all of our cameras at once. So now we have our third camera. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete the keyframes on our third camera so that we don't get tripped up again like we did before. And now we have no keyframes for all future cameras, which is perfect until we need them. So I'm gonna go four, five, oops, four, five, escape six escape now we have all our cameras perfect so back to our second shot camera two this is going to be a simple zoom in and again zooming in panning all these should be linear we want them to be a linear consistent motion not a curved motion like an ease so pretty much all these shots i think we're, are going to end up being linear so what we'll do here is go ahead and just we could bind this to our view and just zoom in however much we think is good. Actually, let's start maybe. These other cameras are tripping me up. Let me hide them temporarily here. Okay, I wanna like really make sure this is centered. Create a keyframe again, otherwise your changes will be lost. And then uh, how zoomed in do you guys think we should be? Well, let's try it, let's experiment. So if we zoom in a lot, let's do like that. Let's see what happens. Dang, should have done it here. Click on your frame first. So let's, let's zoom in a lot. Let's do like that much and see what this feels like in the graph editor. It did default to linear, which is great. I guess that's because that's what we had before. So if we watch this, you know, that's not bad. I don't mind it, but it almost feels a little bit too obnoxious, too intense. I don't know about you guys, but to me, one of the things that's a sign that something is done very, very well is how subtle it is, right? Like it's there, but it's very subtle, right? It's subtle enough that some people might not pick up on it, but it's still there in general and it just feels professional. Whereas if we make things too drastic like this, I think we're maybe zooming in too quick, too fast. It just takes away from the subtlety. So let's come back here and maybe just zoom out a couple clicks and keyframe that and see what happens. Right, doesn't that feel a lot more subtle? And in a way, it almost feels even more badass, right? Because you're not forcing anything. It's very like calm and collected. And I don't know, sometimes you just can't even explain it. it. Just feels right, you know? Now that one might be a little bit too subtle. We can always play around with that later. Sometimes changing the view helps. Maybe let's just come in just to add. Of course, I could have just moved this as well, right? Looks good. I'm gonna come a tiny bit more. I'm telling you guys, this is where your true indecisiveness is gonna come out. Okay, we're sticking with that. Next shot. So now we need to do our first detail shot, right? If you recall, we're on to our detail number one. So I think it's about time we showed off the primary star feature of this hat, which is the patch, right? What makes this hat unique? It's this patch in the corner. So let's come up with a shot that can really showcase this guy. So yeah, maybe we can do another pan where we're, you know, we start in the rule of third there. We can put our, our patch in the third and then we just pan down and start revealing a bit of that brim and just kind of showcasing this aspect of the patch. So maybe if we start around there, we'll keyframe that and then we'll come up to our 130. And guys, look what I've done. I started editing number two again. I didn't change my active camera. Let's undo this, undo, 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 undo. Actually, we should just be able to, let's just quickly keep on doing. Okay, we're saved. I literally just warned you guys about that and I did it myself. So changing the active camera to three. And if you're super nervous, we could even just hide those other cameras. So let's try this again. We're gonna come in here. Sometimes it's easier just to pull it right in there where we want it. So you can see one thing that's happening here, guys, is we're actually, as I'm pulling that in, it's actually 
actually clipping with this hat. And the reason for that is just because by default, your cameras do need to clip at some point. And that's under this camera tab, we have our clip start and clip end. So by default, anything less than 0.1 meters will get clipped. So all we gotta do is just change that to a smaller number and that will automatically allow it to show those smaller increments. We could bring our end down too if we wanted to. Actually, no, I'm gonna keep that up. I don't want that clip in the backdrop by accident. So over here, we can we'll position our camera that. I think maybe it's a little too close. So let's pull them back just a bit. Then I'm gonna come this way. Add. And yeah, I think we can maybe start like this and then pan down. So first of all, let's figure out, you can see our camera's at a bit of an angle. I think I'd actually prefer this to be straight facing on. So I can change our X rotation to 90 and then we're just gonna have to pull that down. I think that's decent. So making sure we have our third camera selected and that it's active, we can create a keyframe, come up to our 130. Huh, you know what's happening here, guys? It's switching to my other camera because I haven't told my timeline to switch to my third camera. I forgot to do that. And this is actually why it keeps on switching back. So let me undo that real quick. I got my shot. What I need to do is actually come down here to this marker and Command-B, bind that. Command-B, why is that not working? Okay, got it bound. Let me just go ahead and bind my other markers too, just before I forget, because that will cause problems. I don't know why my shortcut's not working anymore. Four, five, and six. So now they're all bound. You have to remember that as soon as we bind a camera to a, a marker, then the second that we change our keyframe, as long as that keyframe occurred after that marker, it's gonna change it back to that camera, right? So now you can see as I'm popping through here, if you look in the top right, it's actually popping between those different cameras. So back to our third camera. Did I lose it? Oh, it's because I'm over here. Okay, make sure you're in the right part of the, the timeline. So we're gonna come here to our 130 frame. We're going to move this camera just a little bit down and that's it. We're just gonna do a small little pan between those two shots. Um, I'm intentionally trying to get this patch in the in that rule of thirds approximately both times. Um, maybe I could have come just a tiny bit side to side, like there maybe. I do need to keep that Y though on both, so I'm just gonna copy that manually. So that it's, it's strictly a vertical pan. And that is now easing, which I don't want, so I can hit T on my keyboard and make that linear. So there's our nice subtle shot. And with the logo, whoops, it'll look something like that. So I think that's doing a nice detail number one. Let's move on to our next shot. For this next shot, maybe we can spice things up a little bit. And what if we went for like a side side shot? So I'm thinking kind of like this. I'm gonna again reset our angles. And perhaps this shot can be, like I said, a bit spicy. What could we do to this shot, right? So far we've kind of had this in the distance reveal. We've had a top down zoom in. We've had a close up of our patch. I think right about now maybe it's about time to get a nice side profile of our hat zoomed out a little bit. Also worth noting, we just finished a zoom. We just finished a pan, which is an up and down pan. So maybe it's time for like a side pan or another option actually is maybe we don't even pan at all Maybe we actually decide to animate our hat itself. What if we just keep our camera still here? Let's just play around with this idea. So we'll keep our camera still uh, We will need to still keyframe this though. So let's go ahead and hit actually do we need to keyframe this? We do not because we've keyframed the, the camera itself to the marker We have bound that and that's all we really needed So if we're not planning to animate the camera, we can actually not worry about keyframes at all So what what if we do something, I don't know, let's just play around with this. What if we came in here, took our hat, and what if we rotated it perhaps? Um, actually, before I do this, I definitely need to keyframe my hat, um, otherwise I'm gonna lose this starting position. So I guess probably best way is let's come back to frame zero, and we'll just keyframe our hat's location and rotation. I'm gonna keyframe both because I may end up changing the hat's location and rotation later on. So naturally we're gonna have to keyframe both of those now, otherwise we'll lose one of them. I don't think I'm ever gonna change the scale, so I'm not gonna worry about keyframing the scale. So I'll do that there, and then we can come on over to our camera four, and this is where our animation potentially begins. So I could create a new keyframe here and start playing around. What if I maybe rotate this? Like, I don't know, what do you guys think? What if we, what if we did like one of these things? Now, obviously from like a physics perspective, that's not like a <laughs> vibe shot but I don't know honestly guys like at this point this is just where you get creative right play around with your different options to me this is almost giving me like lowrider vibes you know what I mean for all you Californians 
our hat can literally jump up and down. <laughs> we could even uh, animate that, although we'd have to change our pivot point. I'm not gonna actually make it bounce, but I think maybe something like this could be a kind of a cool, like it's rolling in. It's doing a wheelie even, right? Or uh, like you're pulling a manual on your skateboard. So there's enough parallels there that go along with our theme. I'm gonna go ahead and just do this. I think what I want first though, is I'm just gonna zoom out just like a smidge. And to do that, I'm just gonna hit ZZ and just pull myself out a tiny bit. Try that and then we can come just a little bit more here again we want to get that rule of thirds to the best we can okay so our hat's gonna oh we lost our keyframe once again so let's do this again um we're gonna rotate pull them up a little bit oh no we ha we have a keyframe there i guess it just uh we never set it that's what happened so here we go we'll rotate on the x pull them up a little bit I actually want to be pretty much straight on here i'm gonna keyframe this hat before i lose it again come back to my camera and let's just check to see what's going on here Okay, so our camera set, cap is set, and you can see by default what actually happened as soon as I created that hat keyframe, it's interpolating, right? My first keyframe was way back here, and throughout all these shots is actually slowly raising the hat up, which is definitely not what I want. So what I would do here is change the interpolation. In this case, um, again, remember it, it was Bezier, and before I would do linear for the camera. In this case, I want constant, which will do a hard drop, right? Basically keep the old keyframe all the way until the very end, until I hit that point and then just snap to my new position, right? So again, back to cameras, if you did want to just use one camera instead of the six camera approach, like I'm doing, this is how you would do that. You'd have to set that to a constant keyframe interpolation for that keyframe so that you could immediately snap to your next shot. So let's go ahead and animate this hat. Remember to keyframe it. And this keyframe again is constant, which we don't want anymore. Let's make it, if we highlight these, so between these two keyframes, we want these to be Bezier. And now kind of get that shot and I'll just change it to that, to the solid view so you can get a quicker view of that. So I don't mind the easing on this one. I think that could be kind of a cool effect. I think we need to come back just a little bit on the hat. It's hard to get that full feel when this isn't in real time. I know I'm not rendering this at 20 FPS. This feels too slow, but let's give that a shot. And then for our final detail I think we really want to spice this up so one idea I had is to actually get our hat to spin which I think could look kind of cool so let's take our camera and find a good spot for it if it were to spin what I'm picturing here is like you know the hat starts with the brim maybe up here and then it just kind of does a 270 kind of spins around and kind of ends up in our final position could be a cool shot also from like a in intentionality perspective. We're giving our audience that full 360 view of the hat, right? Like we talked about earlier, it's nice to fully demonstrate what this hat will look like. Um, if this was a true ad, um, your audience will probably wanna know some of those details. So what I'm actually gonna do maybe is just go back to our very first frame with our hat and just copy its position there. So to do that, you can just go and copy there and then I can j actually just paste where I'm at because this is the current place in my timeline. However, we don't want it to interpolate like that. Otherwise, our hat's gonna come down, which maybe is actually kind of cool. Nah, I don't like it. So for some reason, this didn't. What's going on here is we only keyframed our location last time, not our rotation, which means this time we either have to also keyframe our rotations back here to what they used to be, or we just make sure this is a constant. So if we just hide our X, Y, and Z, we could go ahead and just highlight those and hit constant and that's not going to do it because I also need to highlight both sides and now that will snap it back right now I can show these other ones and we should be good right we still got that animation on the location and then we snap back and now we have kind of like that fresh starting point to animate with so with my camera five let's go ahead and get our shot the way we want it in this case I think I do want it right in the center and I think this is where we want to end so what we could do is of course keyframe this hat at the end and I don't think we want to keyframe this camera once again I think this camera will be a still and we'll just rotate our hat so we can take our hat and go to our last frame we can go ahead and keyframe that come back to our first frame and let me just actually quickly make sure this is also constant right so now that we've keyframed those last frames let's come back here and we'll figure out how to rotate this guy so it's gonna be the Z that rotates, right? So I think I want it to maybe start like over here kind of thing and then go back like this. And I think we're gonna make it drop from the sky too because this is kind of boring by itself. I mean, let's try it, let's just see what happens. So let's perhaps start there. And we didn't animate because we are still on constant time. Let's change it to Bezier. 
Okay, that obviously wasn't the reason either. What's going on? Oh, that's why. Not sure how that happened. So we'll make this bezier, right? Um, let's also, while we're at it, animate the height. So again, that was our ending. We'll come back to the start and let's raise the hat up a little bit. Perhaps we can start around there so we can kind of fall like that. Now, I don't love this easing. Um, I think mainly because it's easing in and out. So I don't want it to ease in, I think. Um, just my gut in this scenario, I'd rather like start really quick and then kind of end really, really smooth and slow, right? Get that like casual, just like drift into space. Like, you know, like those videos where those guys are drifting and then they're like casually just like drift right into a parallel parking spot. You know, that's kind of what I'm picturing here, right? Just like a super chill, like end very slow, but it starts off like super fast. Whereas right now it's like slowly picking up speed, getting fast and then slowing down again, which is not quite what we want. So to do that, we of course could just come into these curves and cur like change them ourselves, do something like this, which would, um, you know, start fast and kind of end slow, something like that. So we might need to do that, but let's just see what our options are here. Um, another thing that we might do, just make sure we're selecting the right frames here, is there is different easing types. So right now, easing types won't affect anything because our current interpolation mode is Bezier, but we can actually come to these pre-calculated easing methods. So we got sinusoidal, quadratic, cubic, basically the, the higher up you go, the more intense it's gonna be. So maybe let's try like quadratic. You can see that's the curve it's gonna make. And by default, it's actually already easing out, which is what I wanted. So it starts quick and then ends slow. Kind of just drifts right in there, which is nice. And the reason for that is because right now we're set to easing out. And by the way, I'm hitting Command E on my keyboard, which is probably Control E on Windows. And you can see if I change this to ease in, it does the opposite. It starts really, really slow and then ends fast, which is not really what, I mean, kind of a cool effect too. It's kind of winding up, but I think that's not the effect I was going for at least. Of course, we could do ease in out, which is what we had before. Not what I want, I want simply easing out. So here we go. Now, I think this could be even more intense, honestly. Let's just try it if we go T. Let's do exponential, right? Pull that curve up even more. Do you see kind of like that effect I'm going for? Start really fast, just like spin really quick. Like someone just flick this hat with their wrist or something, you know, and then it just kind of like settles in nicely. That's nice. What we could even do is turn this into a full 360 so that it starts here. Let's just try that and see what happens. And then it actually kind of really does that full flick. I don't know, do you guys like that? Maybe too much. What if we, I don't know, start like there. Whoops, forgot to keyframe it. There we go. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that, I think. One idea I just had, I think that would make this a, a tiny bit nicer, is if we actually animated the rotation of the hat upon its local X axis. So uh, I'll just do it real quick. So if I hit R, X, X, I can tilt it up maybe a little bit like this. And now it's actually like tilted up and then like settling down, you know? I think it could just kind of give that cool effect. If I pull that up, hit I there, you can see what's happening. It starts kind of with the brim up and then settles its way in. And maybe we're accidentally, again, going Bob Ross here. Maybe we're actually, this is a happy accident, right? Cause now it's a nice transition. We've gone from this like low rider hat shot. It's pointed upwards and then now it's continuing to point upwards. I mean, maybe we could even come up a little bit more like that, right? And then, so it's kind of continuing from that same angle and going ahead and just settling in, ready for our last shot. So for our last shot, we do that zoom out approach, right? We're onto our zoom out. And the reason for this, if you recall, is to basically wrap things up, right? It's the finale, it's, it's where we can now, you know, we've hit that peak and now it's time to come back down and relax and, right, we're, we're telling that story. We started zooming in, we, we brought the audience into the product, showed them all the details, and now we're gonna zoom back out and I think the best angle for that is the same angle we used for our still which is this one so I think the easiest approach here is actually just gonna be to duplicate this guy again so we can duplicate it we can call it our video uh, video 6 which already exists so it's gonna try to call it 7 let's just actually remove our camera 6 and then we can bind our new camera with that frame and this should actually be called six and we can back down into our video cameras and now we have that angle now if we switch between these shots they're still popping into six like we'd expect so for this shot we will be animating the camera so we can go ahead and keyframe 
I guess we need to ask ourselves, is this where we want to end up or is this where we want to start or somewhere in between? Perhaps somewhere in between. What do you guys think? So let's go to the very end frame and we can maybe zoom out just a tad. We'll keyframe that, come back to the beginning, zoom in a little bit more. Again, we don't want to be doing too much because this is supposed to be subtle. This is trying to ease by default. So let's go ahead and change this to linear. Now, the only risk with this is if this is the exact order we're going in, we're going from this kind of shot to this shot, which is very, very similar, but different enough to be kind of jarring. So I think if we're going to keep this approach, we're going to need to come up with some sort of good transition between these two clips to make that transition look a little bit less jarring I guess you know it's kind of like when you have two colors side by side that are like barely off from each other right if you have like a color palette for your design whatever you're building and there's just like one color that's like very close to another color but slightly off it just looks wrong right this is kind of similar so again let's just try it We'll see what happens, but we, we may need to play around with um, that transition between them to make this look a little bit more natural. So all together, let's go through, reveal, zoom in, detail one, detail two, detail three, zoom out. Now looking at detail two, I kind of wish that was going a little bit faster. So I wonder if we can play around with the, um, with the easing on that guy. So again, let's just hide all the axes we don't care about. I think it's just the Y. Oh, let's keep them all just in case. And yeah, it was the Y that we were primarily animating, although we are animating the X as well. So what we could do here, and you know, I'm just gonna highlight all three axes just to keep things consistent. Let's try, instead of the Bezier, let's try one of these other easings. What if we try quadratic? So that was an ease in scenario. Let's try ease out. I think that's probably closer to what I was picturing in my head and maybe not so drastic so we can maybe go quadratic oh, but I did like that speed it feels too slow now Let's just do exponential just for kicks I really like the speed at the beginning but I don't think I like how slow it ends up there it just feels like it's lingering for too long so probably quadratic is our sweet spot unless we want to try easing in and out. Let's see what that looks like. I mean, if we're gonna mimic that low rider slash skateboarding metaphor, then probably the ease in and out is not what we want. Probably more likely we're gonna want that just in one direction. So I'm thinking either ease out, Actually, I think that's our only option, right? You're just kind of like coming in, you're kind of just like drifting in. Unless it was linear, I guess, would be our last option. I think that's too boring though. Let's try, let's, let's just stick to quadratic and we'll do the ease out. I think that's where we're, we can settle on. Technically between these two frames, I'm just looking, they should probably, it doesn't matter because they're just one frame difference. So it, it doesn't actually affect anything, but they are curved when really they should be constant. So just for best practice. So a little low rider, do a little spin. Oh, and something went wrong with our spin. Ah, that constant effect of these guys. There, sorry, I was only supposed to highlight those three, not these other three. Hat spins in, and then we zoom out. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with this. Now keep in mind, all these shots will be a lot quicker. It's just my computer's frame rate isn't quite fast enough to be real time. Okay, perfect. Whoops. Again, this is why you gotta be careful to uncheck lock camera to view or you can accidentally move your camera, right? Okay, next let's talk about exporting. So guys, I realize this video has become quite long. Thanks for bearing with me. Hopefully you guys are learning something useful and this is interesting. Another topic to discuss right now is exporting. So if we come on over to our render properties, scroll to the bottom, we have our color management. Actually first, sorry, let's start with our output properties. Let me not get ahead of myself. In our output properties, by default, we are 1080p at 100%, meaning just like whatever these two are, which is 1080p in this situation, what would you like to render it at? And this is actually quite a useful feature. We'll be 
utilizing shortly. We have a frame rate, which we've already discussed, starting in frame, also discussed that. And now down at the bottom is where you can actually choose to save your file. And as you can see, the default file format is actually PNG. And so for those brand new to animation, how does that work? How do you animate PNGs? Well, you just create multiple PNGs. You actually create a PNG for every single frame of your animation. And you might click on this and notice that there are other options like actual movie formats that you can use here if you wanted to. However, I'm gonna say right now, that's generally bad practice because it's kind of like an all or nothing scenario. At the end of the day, Blender is only gonna render one frame at a time. And so by choosing this movie format, all you're doing is basically saying, hey Blender, render each frame and then combine them into this movie for me, right? And the issue with that is, well, what happens if it fails halfway through or you, your computer dies or whatever? That's it, they're all gone. You have to start all the way at the beginning again, frame by frame to recreate your video. Also, you have no flexibility down the road on re-exporting those frames into a different format. You're stuck to whatever you choose right now. So better practice is to use what's called image sequences where you're actually just going to output frame by frame into a folder with all the frames. So in this case, we're gonna end up with 260 images in some folder and quite often what people will use is PNG and I used to use PNG as well as this is a very popular image format supports RGBA if you want that transparency, which can be convenient. However, um, nowadays there's an even better practice and that's OpenEXR. The reason why OpenEXR is a better practice is because it stores more information about your render. And what does that mean? Like, how is that useful? Well, as opposed to PNGs, which will literally bake in whatever your color management properties are here, right? So down here, and I'll show you shortly what this is, if this is brand new to you when it's rendering it actually needs to render to a color space using a lookup table and um, by default now in in the most recent versions of blender we have filmic as our default and then you can choose like different contrast levels so when you choose png it will actually bake this right into it however if you do it into open exr it doesn't actually pre-bake any of that and so that actually allows you to apply those color space lookup tables downstream and i think this is the perfect way to go because my philosophy in general when it comes to almost any workflow on any program is to, to be as non-destructive as possible. And we've talked about that a little bit already within Blender, right? We preferred to keep our stitch non-destructive, meaning that we didn't have to apply our modifier and convert it to a mesh, which means now we no longer have the ability to change it, right? Non-destructive means we can keep it throughout the entire workflow, in this case, a stitch, so that even down the road, I could change the stitch at the very end and, and still have that full flexibility, right? So that was a non-destructive workflow within Blender. Now, what about within video editing? That's where OpenEXR comes in. You can export to open EXR, it maintains that image information and then whatever tool you're using downstream, which in our case will be DaVinci Resolve, you can actually go ahead and set that lookup table there and apply the contrast there instead, which means that gives us more flexibility down the road if we ever needed to change colors or any kind of color management aspect of this. We can change that downstream in our video editing software versus having to come back here and literally have to re-render every single frame over again with that new color information. So this is best practice. And thankfully, DaVinci Resolve supports OpenEXR out of the box. We'll get into that shortly here. So we're gonna go ahead and choose a output folder. Let's create a new folder called Render. And then within Render, we could just put it right here in Render, but what I'm gonna propose right now is a workflow that I've come to love and has worked really well. And I'd love to share that with you guys. Hopefully it works well for you too. And that workflow is, well, the motivation comes from this. On many computers, especially mine, Cycles renders are not quick, right? For every frame that I want to render, Cycles takes quite a bit of time, especially depending on the number of samples that you're going to use. Now we can bring our samples down, which I will. I'll bring this down to, I've actually had luck to bring this to as low as 32, which obviously won't look as good in the end, but especially with this modern denoising feature, which by default uses the open image denoise, it actually does a pretty decent job. However, you still need to be careful depending on, on what you're rendering. You could get a lot of flickering you may have seen and really there, there's many ways around it. The easiest way is just to up your uh, max samples, which just means longer render times. So what I always try to do is just try to minimize my samples while still maximizing the quality of my video, right? But still 32 samples on 
my current Intel based MacBook Pro. It, it's not the best. I do actually have a Windows based machine that I've built here that I built it a while ago. So it has a, an NVIDIA 1070 graphics card. So it's still much better than, than my MacBook, fortunately. Um, of course, nowadays, if you had an M1 or an M2, AKA Apple Silicon, those things are tanks. They can actually do rendering quite quickly. So anyways, the workflow I want to show you guys is because of how slow that is, we need to think about our risk in this situation. The biggest risk right now is our time, right? So the risk here being we spend probably at least a couple hours rendering all these frames and then pull them into our video editing program and find out that there's something about it that we just didn't like or something that we need to change and tweak. That's not super ideal, right? If it's something that was wrong with the entire scene, well, that sucks. We have to re-render the whole thing. If it's just one of our shots, then perhaps we can just re-export the frames just for that shot, but still not a very quick workflow, right? So what I like to do instead is a couple things. Number one, I like to turn this actually back to Eevee. And the reason for that is, well, first of all, actually, Eevee is actually not looking too, too bad right now. I think this is still for sure gonna look better in cycles, but um, with Eevee, you actually get obviously not terrible results. And depending on what you're rendering, you can maybe even get away with using Eevee for the whole thing. In this situation, I want a little bit more realism, so I'm gonna keep cycles as my render engine, but Eevee is more than enough to help me at least, in a way, roughly scaffold out my video, right? I can export this all in Eevee relatively quickly and start loading that into my video editor and start editing these clips together, creating all my transitions, align it to my music, all of that. And then while I'm doing all that work, or maybe be smarter to wait till I'm done, just to make sure there's nothing I need to change. When I'm happy with everything, then I come back here and change it back to cycles, up it to the quality that I want, and I'll probably run it on my 1070 on my other computer. And honestly, I'll probably just run that overnight. And I can be fairly confident that I'm going to be happy with it the next day because I've already done all that work in the video editor. Of course, there still might be a couple things that, you know, Eevee never picked up that Cycles will pick up just because of those small changes. And in that case, yes, you will have to render those again. But I think those situations are very few. And I just found this workflow works really nicely. And DaVinci Resolve, again, is great for this concept. And I'll show you how we do that. There's one more thing that I like to do as well, which is to speed up the render times even more, you can just reduce your resolution. So right now I'm at 1080p and I'm going to actually just for our rough render, I'm going to reduce this to 50% so that uh, it's just quicker to render, right? Think about it. If I'm rendering at 50% of the resolution, I'm actually rendering only a quarter of the pixels, right? If it's half 1920 and half 1080, that's only um, rendering a quarter of the pixels at the end of the day. So if I go ahead and hit F12 to render, this will just render a single frame. There, boom, already done within five seconds and probably quicker once it loads it up, it will can pop through them pretty quick. So back to our output folder, we never finished that. We created this render folder and then what I'm gonna do based on what I just said is call Call this draft and then let's give it like a, a version so maybe like draft one in case we create multiple drafts at least we can keep both right so we have draft one and then I'll say accept and then this will actually output this to draft one and then later on when we're happy with it we'll create like a final one as well so I think this is pretty good let's go ahead and render this out and I'll fast forward this for you guys to render your animation you go render render animation which is command f12 on Mac should be control f12 on Windows Oh, sorry, one more thing. Especially since this is just a draft, we don't need the lossless format. We can go ahead and accept the lossy. So I've had good luck with this PXR24 lossy, and I think it's actually really, really close. We can probably even use this for the final one. The benefit of lossy being that the file size is, is much smaller. Lossless means, you know, as it sounds, you're not losing any data whatsoever, but typically the file size is, is much, much bigger, sometimes way bigger than it's worth, right? All right, let's do this. Okay, now that our renders are done, we can go ahead and open these up in DaVinci Resolve. So within DaVinci Resolve, we can head on over to Media. And right now we're inside of our Hat Product Video folder. Here's the render folder we created and draft one. And by default, um, DaVinci Resolve actually picks up that this was a image sequence and it shows up as if it's a video, which is perfect. Drag that into our media pool. And then back in edit, we can go ahead and pull that guy in. And this is already lined up nearly perfect with our audio tracks. Now it's barely not perfect because well, we weren't precise, we just made it rough, right? We made the first one 50 frames instead of 48, et cetera. But we can, we can always cut them now, right? So yeah, the first thing I like to do is go ahead and do that. Go ahead and cut each of our clips 
so that they're separate. So there's our first cut. So I can hit B on my keyboard, cut. And you're probably completely confused right now why our colors are looking off, and I'll explain that in a second. All right, we got our cuts. All right, so let's take a quick look here. I can't take no loss. Huh? I don't even know what it costs. Huh? I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, I can't take no loss. Yeah, I don't even know what it costs. So that's actually pretty decent, and the the cuts actually line up pretty nicely. Uh, we just need to, I think, tweak them just a little bit. And then the other thing is, is I think this would look a little bit better with some sort of like transition between these clips. And we'll, we'll dive into that in a second here. Now, keep in mind, this is not what the final version is gonna look like, right? First of all, recall we just exported this from Eevee and not Cycles. So in terms of 3D image quality, it's gonna look quite a bit different. But again, this is just helping us to line up our shots together, edit it all in a way that we like. And then at the end, we're gonna render that better. And then the other thing that looks off right now is our coloring. And that's because if you recall, we exported in EXR, open EXR format, which under the hood is actually storing each pixel as a float instead of an integer, meaning basically, I guess without going into all the technicals, it allows us to store our image data in linear space instead of a gamma corrected, uh, typically sRGB space. And if you're wondering what the heck am I talking about? What is this linear sRGB gamma corrected stuff? What does all that really mean? Um, I actually go into a little bit of detail on that on my other video called, I wish I knew this before using image textures. I happen to actually just go down a rabbit hole talking about that. So feel free to check that out. It's near the beginning of that video and that can help bring some clarity on that. But how do we actually fix that now in DaVinci Resolve? Right now, all the lighting is coming across as if it's still in linear space and we need to do that gamma correction. So to do that, what we can do is actually head on over to our color tab down here. And the method I'm going to use right now is basically taken directly from Polyfeard. So I highly recommend checking out his video uh, on EXR formats in general and why you might prefer to use that over, like we talked about, over PNGs. So instead of going into all that detail, which basically deserves its own video, I'm just going to point you to Polyfeard's video, which he does a really good job of that. But even if you've watched that, I'll show you my approach to this, right? Essentially what you're doing is you're adding a lookup table here, right? So by default, there is no lookup table and we actually need to add two. We have our uh, filmic down here which I had to add myself by the way again watch his video and he'll show you exactly how to add these in here all these filmic lookup tables are available on github but just to show you really quick what you do is you would add a linear to base encoding right right, right now we're in linear so we need to at least get the base filmic which doesn't look quite right but that's just because of course this is base and then we'll actually add a node in serial here afterwards and from here now that we have that base we can go ahead and apply whatever contrast we want Want. So this should look very similar to what you're used to in Blender, right? You can have high, low, medium, contrast, whatever. Um, there's actually a couple more options here. So let's just choose, I mean, let's do a high contrast. Yeah, it looks okay. I mean, this is gonna look a lot better again in cycles. So this is just kind of giving us that base. I think let's tweak this later once we pull in our, our real cycles render. But one thing I want to point out, and this is kind of coming back to my workflow, I only applied that to the current clip that I have selected, right? So this guy right here, I already separated each of these clips, right? So now if I come over to here or here or any other ones, that uh, color isn't applied. So it's kind of a pain, right? Having to go through each and every single one and apply it. I mean, what we could have done is the very first thing we did is as soon as we brought that clip in, we could have applied that color and then broken it down. But I just want to show you, in my opinion, a better approach here. So if we undo what we just did back Back there and completely take away our lookup tables so now we have whoops let's keep going so no lookup tables selected let's come back to edit and DaVinci Resolve has this very convenient tool here if we come into effects called adjustment clip and what adjustment clip essentially does is it's a new layer on top but basically whatever you apply to this adjustment clip will be applied to everything underneath which is literally perfect for this scenario. And you can use it for, for many different situations, right? You could use it for uh, what we're gonna use it for right now, which is color. So whatever color we apply to this guy right here will be applied to everything underneath it. But you could use this adjustment clip for things like Fusion. You can come into Fusion, which for those who aren't familiar with Fusion, think of it like kind of like what After Effects is to the Adobe Suite. Fusion, I wouldn't say is quite at the same 
tier as After Effects, but it definitely allows you to get a lot more fine grain with those little details. You could actually apply your fusion effects on top of this adjustment layer, and that will just automatically apply to everything underneath, which is super convenient. So again, we're gonna come back to color, do what we did before, apply our base, followed by our, let's do high contrast. And now you'll see that's being applied to all of the clips underneath. And literally, if we had actually exported this as a PNG from Blender and set it to the high contrast, assuming that those, those two lookup tables are the same, which they should be quite similar, you get an identical output right now. And again, the benefit here is now we haven't lost any information, right? So if you were to see what this looks like before I apply this, you could come in there and adjust colors and everything prior to the actual lookup table, essentially, in a non-destructive way, you're able to in post, which I would consider right now we're, we're, we're post render, we're now in our video editing, uh, we still have the flexibility to adjust our colors at that level here instead of having to go back to Blender and re-render everything over again, right? So I think this workflow is the best workflow. Okay, so next thing I think we need to deal with is our ending of our song, right? Right now we have a really nice intro with, with our reveal, right? And then we get right into our zoom, our detail one, two, and three, and then we zoom out. Now the problem is, is the the song just continues on, right? The song is, is much longer than 10 seconds and I don't think we can just quit here. Yeah, I can't take no loss. Yeah, only right? If you can imagine if we just quit right there, that's not very satisfying, right? It's, <laughs> it sounds like the song, you know, the song's continued on and we're like, we haven't even started the song even in a way. And now suddenly the clip's over. It just, it doesn't feel natural, right? So in this situation, we have to do a little bit of composing ourselves. And what I'm going to do is try to find a better ending somewhere in this clip that I can kind of pop in here at the end. And hopefully we can find a way to make it transition nicely. So it sounds like it's, it could have been a 10 second song, if you know what I mean. So let's go further in this song. I mean, good indicators of where that could happen is when you see drops like this, right? This is, you can tell this is going to be a lot of the similar style song based on the, the waves, right? But then down here, we cut into something different. So let's go take a look at that. I really feel it's my time. Think it's my pen ready. Used to hold myself back. My self esteem. Let's listen to the whole thing. I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah. Hit the ground and it go off. Yeah. Yeah. Run it. Run it. Ooh. I really feel it's my time. Think it's my year. Yeah. I really feel it's my time, think it's my year, yeah, yeah. I really feel it's my time, think it's my year, yeah, yeah. I really feel it's my time, think it's my pen ready. So that could be it right there, right? If perhaps we could cut this last segment right in here and right because it goes from like this heavy beat to they take away the beat and this is usually indicating the end of a at least the end of the segment of a song, right? So let's just listen to that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really feel it's my time, think it's my and then it ends. But let's keep looking along this path just because we go right into that next verse, which might be a little bit harder for us to cut. So let's keep listening. That is no surrender, gotta dial up and throw out of fixed deck. I don't really hold out of books, but I'ma learn how to fix deck. So essentially where this thick wave is happening is where the, the beat comes back in, right? Get them when they hand the crypt along how to fix deck. I don't really hold out of books. And the gotta dial up and I'm trying to get an NFT to get them when they hand the crypt along how to fix deck. Actually, sorry, uh, that was wrong. Um, it's not just the, the beat, the beats throughout the whole thing, but you, you can start to hear that background ambient instrument as soon as you come in there again. I'm not a music professional at this point, so there's probably a better term for that. Sometimes our best bet would be just to come to the very end of the clip because obviously this is how they intended the song to end and usually that could cross over nicely. So let's just try this. It's my time, think it's my year, yeah, yeah. I really feel it's my time, think it's my year, yeah. Yeah, I really feel it's my time, think it's my... So right there, I think that's perfect, right? We were originally looking at this one. They feel it's my time, think it's my pen ready. But then it goes right into that next beat, whereas I think this gives us a little bit more leeway. Yeah, yeah, I really feel it's my time, think it's my... Love it. So let's uh, let's try to pull this part out. So we got to figure out where that beat starts. Yeah, I really... Yeah, I really... Yeah, I really feel it's... I really feel it's... I think when he says really, I think that's actually the beat start, but I'm gonna cut it just a little bit back a little bit just so that we have more room to play with. We'll come here and, and by the way, I'm hitting option or alt on windows on my keyboard as I'm using my scroll wheel and that's how I'm zooming in and out here. I can't take no so I think this can go. By the way, I love DaVinci Resolve for this. When you hit delete on your keyboard, it'll just pull the next clip over, which is super convenient. Um, I could have hit backspace and that wouldn't have done that, uh, but then you can actually select empty space in DaVinci Resolve too. So you can hit backspace on that, it does the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I really so somewhere in here, we get a double yeah. yeah, yeah Let's just play around and see what we can do here. I really feel it's my time, think it's my... 
We're gonna really wanna make sure it's our time, it's our year, just kidding. We're gonna really wanna make sure we get the beat spot on, otherwise this is gonna sound super unnatural, right? So that doesn't sound right. So I think really, when he says really, that's where the beat starts. So we, we pretty much have to start it there. Really feel it's my So you gotta be careful in DaVinci Resolve. When you have auto track selector selected, it will, if I hit delete, it would have deleted that other track as well. But in this case, what's probably easier is just for me to pull that in. Up here, you can hit N on your keyboard and that will snap, which is convenient. So I think that's what we want. So let's get rid of the other guy there. Got no more track, good. That really is where that beat started. So I think hopefully this cut works out nicely. Go up, yeah. really feel it's my time, think it's my... Now, if you're a music composer, I'm sure this is not perfect in your eyes. And if you have those skills, you could certainly remix this yourself to have that perfect 10 second clip. But I think this is actually not bad for what we're trying to accomplish right now. Let's listen to the whole thing. So this is what I warned you guys about before too, how it, it jumps from here to here, which is like two, they're almost too similar, but also different enough. Like in this case, the camera angle is different enough to, to be noticeable. And it just kind of feels off, feels kind of jarring. We'll tackle that in a second. Sometimes I get ADD with this stuff. Let's let's just make sure our music is correct first. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, really feel it's my time, think it's my. So that felt okay to me, right? It didn't feel like we just lost our beat. Let's do it one more time. Uh, I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, really feel it's my time. Think it's my. I think that is totally doable. Now, one thing you can do if you want the music to fade out a little bit nicer is just simply add in some keyframes here on the volume. So if I hold Option or Alt on my keyboard and click, I'll create a little keyframe there and create a couple. And then the second one, I might just pull down here at the very end. Just to fade that out. Let's just try it. Yeah, really feel it's my time, think it's my... I think that's a little bit nicer. I really don't want to fade to the very last minute if I can avoid it. Oops. I'm holding shift to kind of keep that same level. I think it's my... Yeah, I think I like that. So we talked about transitions. This is where your creative freedom can really come out. And also I'd say this, this will greatly depend on what kind of video you're going to make. Again, we're going for like that more epic, badass cool video, right? Our target audience is gonna, we want them to get stoked about this hat, right? So again, play around. One transition I've had good luck with is the digital glitch. I think it can look kind of good. Now, you don't want to overuse this either. You got to be careful. I'm sure you guys have all seen this transition before, but uh, for the purpose of this video, I'm going to use it. I think it's, it can actually work nicely for this composition. Again, another convenient thing about DaVinci Resolve is they do give you some of these effects for free here. Now, some of these won't be free, and that's where it's worth buying the full version if, if you really want those, but uh, Digital Glitch is free. So one thing you can do is just pass that into... Um, actually, sorry, I think I'm wrong. Digital Glitch is part of our effects. Um, Let's head on over to our video transitions. And I think there's something in here similar. So we got camera shakes, can play around with. Here we go, glitch. This is what I was thinking of. So transitions can be added on either one side of a clip, the other side, or in between them. So let's just experiment here. So you notice there, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. What's going on? This is actually because computationally there's too much happening there for my computer to display that in real time. So what you can do is you can come to playback at the top here, choose render cache. And if you choose smart, this red bar has now just appeared at the top. And let me just play real quick. You can see it's starting to turn blue. This means it's actually caching the result of that transition so that uh, if I try to play it again, it will play it more in real time. You can see it's actually doing it now. Now, I didn't like that. I think that looks not that great at all. I don't think that really did anything for us. So I'm just gonna delete that. We can play around. Let's see, we, we're we looking at camera shake there too. Really what I want here is like, again, I want this to line up with our soundtrack as closely as possible. So let's listen to this. So when he says run it, I think that would be the perfect time for a transition, right? You can you can close your eyes and visualize this, right? This this hat's getting revealed. We're creating some suspense right now. And then, you know, we're ready just to jump right into it, right? So when he says run it, this could be like our glitch transition to our next shot, right? You can imagine run it. Let's let's show something there. 
there. So about here is where he says run it. So I'm actually gonna clip my first clip there, or cut rather, my first clip. And I'll say it again, this is truly where you can get creative. But if you think about it, nothing's forcing us to do a transition on our existing clip, right? What if we actually pulled a different clip later on? For example, this, uh, this hat spin is like one of our coolest detail effects, right? This is our, almost like the climax of our, our video, if you will. So what if we actually took a portion of that, popped it in here as one of our transitions, almost like foreshadowing in a way, right? This is gonna come later on in the shot. And then of course we can add some cool effects or transitions on top of that too, if we want to. So I'm gonna delete this. And by the way, you don't have to be afraid to delete stuff. You can always pull things back. Um, you're not actually deleting anything since this is all the same underlying clip. All we're doing is deleting that, uh, the reference to that point in time. But again, we can pull it back. So let's maybe, what part of this would look good, do you think? Like, I don't know, let's just try there. So actually, I'm just gonna copy that, paste that there, pull it back, and let's bring that on over here. All right, so we're getting a little bit of that spin. So we're kind of, again, we're kind of foreshadowing this. Now, this is too clear, right? This is exactly how it's gonna look like later. So I think now is a great time to add that glitch effect. By the way, the transitions can be found on the right-hand side here, glitch. Uh, apparently this glitch effect actually has no settings. Yeah, I don't like that. I think uh, in this case, maybe let's go back to effects and try our glitch effect, digital glitch. So we're basically manually creating this transition in a way. Here, this is what I was going for, right? You can see this. This is kind of like that glitch effect. So like just for a split flash when he says, run it, we're gonna foreshadow that other thing, but it's not gonna be completely crystal clear, right? We're gonna have that glitch effect just to kind of um, give them a taste of what's to come. Now in situations like this, you really just have to use your gut. Like what feels right here? So to me, something still doesn't feel quite right. Right, it feels like this little foreshadowing flash is, it's too long almost, if, if you can feel that. Right, um, I think it, it still needs to start here, right? If, if I shorten it like this, well, let's just see what happens. See, that actually feels a little bit better, but I think let's try to move that, instead of cropping that side, let's crop this side just a little bit. So what that's actually gonna do is literally have a black period there within our shot, which I think actually works for us here. So let's try it. Like even shorter maybe. So snapping is going against me right now. So I can hit N to turn off snapping temporarily. And you can see these actually aren't lining up. I think let's line those up now. Turn snapping back on. So you guys start to kind of feel what we're going for here, right? I don't know, maybe we can trim off the beginning and the end of that. Again, just keep tweaking this till you kind of get what feels right to you. See, I like that, right? It's almost like not even noticeable, this like two frames of black and then two frames of black afterwards. But something about that spacing, to me, just, just feels like this clip is coming in at the right time. Um, it just felt too long before. And especially since we have like our scenes already very dark, I think these black clips play well with this idea, right? Right, so run it and then jump right in. We're getting closer. So the question we need to ask ourselves now is, is that all we wanna do for quote unquote transitions or do we wanna do some more throughout these different shots? Well, I think we almost for sure need one at the end here, unless we're gonna go ahead and completely change our, our camera shots in general. So yeah, let's experiment with this and see what we can do. We can we can try something similar. We can pull that out a little bit. So when he says, yeah, that yeah can be our, our transition, right? I mean, we could get away with nothing, like a black again. But I think throwing something in there is gonna look better than nothing. Just for kicks, let's just try our other shot that we did before, our other transition. Just do the same thing, basically. I like that, actually. I think that looks quite nice, right? It's kind of like this shot glitching for a second and then back to it again, right? It's almost like we intended it now. Like, we wanted it between this shot and this shot to look similar. And guys, I'd say, like, this is half of being an artist, right? It is, <laughs> uh, it's all about those happy accidents. It's all about taking a problem and turning it into a feature, right? Classic programmer motto. It's not a bug, it's a feature, right? Turn something that uh, is actually causing you headaches and turn it into something that uh, you pretend it was actually intentional the whole time. Hit the ground and it go off, yeah. Really feel it's my time, think it's my... 
yeah and you know sometimes you just can't explain it i don't know i can't fully explain why i like this but i think it looks really nice okay let's start from the top i can't take no loss i don't even know what it costs i hit the ground and it go off yeah hit the ground and it go off yeah really feel it's my time so i think i'm okay with some of these not having to cut or sorry some of these not having to transition like between here and there um, I think that's like a, a smooth transition if it just is a single cut like that. Again, we don't want to overuse this effect that we're, that we're doing here, otherwise it just looks tacky. I can't take no loss, huh? I don't need right, that feels like a natural transition, as it is. Let's keep going. There too, I don't mind that at all. I hit the ground and it go off, yeah, hit the ground. But I think right here, between those two shots, I feel like I almost feel like I want to see something there. And again, how can I explain that? I mean, part of it might just be the way the music is, right? Let's listen to the music. I can't take no loss. Huh. I don't even know what it costs. Huh. So he's doing the huh at the end of both of those, right? Lost, huh. I don't even know what it costs. Huh. So th that doesn't really make me feel like I need a transition. Let's keep going. Ground in go off. Yeah. Hit the I don't know, something about that yeah there and probably something to do with that combined with just the way these shots are blending together i don't know let's just try it. i want to i want to see what it looks like with the transition here so again let's let's do something different we don't want to overdo the glitch there's some interesting ones down here under fusion transitions we have that camera shake which could be kind of interesting right oh uh, <laughs> i actually didn't even know that i was always confused how you preview these so you can see my cursor going left and right that actually is showing me how this transition will preview over the current clip that, that i'm on super cool learn something new every day so something like this right those swipe transitions or the circles this is way too tacky right this is like something you find in your home video and yeah the art here is subtlety right guys i'm just gonna say right now this is not what i'm going for at least let's try the zoom see zoom could potentially be an option for us depending on what that looks like looking through here drop warp could be kind of cool that's almost i mean we can try it but it's almost too much again i think we're going a little bit overboard with that definitely not <laughs> definitely not our fall on bounce film strip maybe maybe film strip it'd have to be really quick yeah let's try it let's just see what film strip does again we only want to do it on the yeah i think yeah hit the ground and it go off yeah really feel it's my hit the ground and it go off yeah hit the ground and it go off Maybe it's just too quick, right? You, it's hard to tell what's actually happening. Uh, we could come into our transition here. This one has some settings. Could decrease the shutter speed, maybe. Let's keep playing around. I'm not sure if I'm in love with that. Flip 3D, that, that's like your classic grade three slideshow. Let's not do that. Glitch we've already looked at. Paint on, I think that will look pretty tacky. I kind of like the idea of this zoom in, honestly. I like to see that through maybe. So we had a couple, we had zoom in down here. What was the other one up here? Crash zoom, well, let's just try crash zoom. Let's see what this is gonna happen here. Oh, so it does like a couple. No, that's not what I'm going for. Let's try the other zoom. Right when he says yeah, I want to like zoom in, right? Yeah, hit the ground. I wonder if I need to just trim this clip down. Yeah, hit the ground. Right, because before I was applying the zoom in effect just on this clip, and since it has nothing to transition to, it just transitions to itself. Oh no, okay. I've added this black space here, so now it's gonna transition into that black space. I think that's better. Let's take a look at some settings here. Do we like how intense that is? Timing is so important in this situation, right? Especially with how short and quick this song is, timing is key. So if, for example, I could connect this all the way to the end and then extend out my transition to be longer, but... Yeah, hit the now it's kind of too slow, right? So I think what we'll do is we'll actually just intentionally have a blank space afterwards so that we can shorten our transition. Where does he say, yeah? Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Right, and again, these completely black shots work well with our composition. Go off, yeah, hit the I think it's not quick enough still. There we go, I think we're getting close, guys. And what I recommend in these situations is if you've been working on something for too long and you can't decide, you're feeling indecisive, just take a step back, look at the big picture, start from the top again and go all the way through. And sometimes just seeing it flow from one end to the other can help you reevaluate what's going on and, and what you're trying to do in this situation, right? Sometimes I get a bit of tunnel vision if I'm not careful. So let's let's listen to the whole thing again. I can't take no loss. I don't even know what it costs. Hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and 
to go off. Yeah, really feel it's my time, think it's my... I like it. I think we're getting pretty close. Now, one thing that has frustrated me with the video editing portion of this process is I'll line it up all perfectly on like what sounds perfect in DaVinci Resolve. I'll export it and then the timings are different. And I think it's just because uh, not that DaVinci Resolve is changing anything. I think it's just that like in my preview here, whether it's my computer or another factor, what I'm listening to in the preview isn't actually what it really is. It's a little bit delayed. Like right there. It almost felt like that top-down zoom-in shot came in too late. It felt like the beat started. Let's just do it again. Sorry, other way around. The felt like the scene came in before the beat actually dropped. And I want that to transition and like perfectly as that beat comes in, right? Um, but if we look at the actual audio waves, this is truly where the beat drops. So I guess we won't know until we export this uh, to see what, what it's really gonna sound like. But just a word of caution there is, uh, might not be worth spending like loads and loads of time in here trying to perfect those timings before at least trying to um, do a quick export and just listen to it to see how it sounds. So let's, uh, let me take my own advice and let's go ahead and deliver this. Um, deliver essentially is in DaVinci Resolve where you would do your exporting. And actually another way to do this is just to, I believe there's an option here that says file quick export. Yeah, and by default, I'll just export everything. You can hit I and O on your keyboard to set specific in, like start and ends if you want to do that for your quick export or for your actual export. Option X to remove that, yep. And uh, that can help you too. In this case, I wanna hear the whole thing. So I think for now, let me just create a new folder called export and I'm gonna call this, we don't need a folder, but let's just call this um, sample one. All right, I have it open here. Let's take a listen. I can't take no loss. Huh. I don't even know what it costs. Huh. I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, really feel it's my time. Think it's my. Now this looks quite bad. Remember, this is both EV and remember we actually exported it at 50% resolution. So this is actually like half of 1080p. So don't get caught up in that part. We just want to make sure our transitions look nice. I can't take no loss. I almost feel like our run it is coming in a little bit too soon. I can't take no loss. Huh. Let's just pay attention to that hat where the beat drops. I can't take no I can't take no Yeah, it feels like it's coming in before the actual beat and maybe we messed up. I can't take no No loss. Huh. I don't even know what it costs. Huh. I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, really feel it's my time. Think it's my The rest of those shots felt almost perfect. I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah. That was good. Hit the ground and it go off, yeah. That was good as well. Really feel it's my time, think it's my. Let's just tweak that uh, first transition there. So, what do we think? We thought the run it was coming in just a little bit too soon. And then this one, where does the beat actually hit? Maybe it's because the beat's right there. I can't take right, our, our problem was the. <clears throat> The clip was coming in before the beat. So let's just trim that a little bit back and maybe we can even afford to move this down just a tiny bit more. And if that's too much, we can always undo that, but let's just see how that goes. Okay, let's take a listen. That beat still feels like the video's coming in too soon, but I think our transition is better. I like the run it. That feels like that's timed out right now. The other one's still coming in too soon. Let's just overdo it. Okay, here we go. What is with that, eh? What do you guys think? Do we need to tweak it some more? Just trying to understand. I think it's pretty close. I'm telling you guys, you're gonna drive yourselves crazy listening to this over and over again. I can't take no loss. I don't think we can go any further than that. So let's uh, let's keep that. I think it's pretty good. I like it. We're done. We're gonna commit to it. Enough with this indecisiveness. Now the last thing we need to ask ourselves before creating our high quality renders is, are we happy with? everything from the blender side and this isn't the easiest to answer at this point because again we're using ev not cycles so we don't know exactly what it's going to look like but one thing i've noticed throughout this is some of the lighting is a bit too harsh right we set up our lighting from this shot's perspective but we didn't tweak it at all for these other shots so like that lighting might be a little bit too harsh right 
um, it's, it's, it's very harsh and very directed right there. So as we're transitioning the hat, um, that might not be the lighting that we want. So that's one scene we need to consider. Also that lighting in the background there, we had that as a bit of a backlight and um, it's not really doing anything for us in this shot. So probably something we need to reconsider. Same with this, right? What's with this light? What's with this light? Where it's a little bit confusing. So we might need to rethink our lighting here. So let's look into this. And again, super happy we just did a quick render in EV first, right? Otherwise we would have had to re-render our entire high quality cycles renders again. So I'm gonna uncheck locked camera viewport everywhere just to make sure that we don't accidentally move our cameras because we are happy with our cameras at this point, I'd say. However, our lighting is a bit funky. So let's come on over to cycles this time because this is where it really matters. And even that shot's a bit funky, right? All, the, all this lighting looks kind of weird. Oh, and we're not in cycles. Here we go, cycles. So a couple options. If we really wanted all three of those lights, then we could just show and hide them according to the shot, which we may end up having to do. Although in this shot, I don't love that backlight there. I think it's confusing what's going on there. It, it worked okay from this shot, but pretty much every other shot looks wrong. So what if we just get rid of that light? We'll come back to this shot, which is one, the one we first used it for. So I think this is our backlight there. Let's just hide that. And funny enough, that's actually not making a big difference anymore. So I'm actually inclined to just get rid of it, right? Since this light, we've done a couple of things. We've added some more other lights. So I'm just going to hide that one. I'm not going to delete it quite yet, but we'll just hide it. Make sure you hide it on the render as well. Otherwise, you'll be surprised to find that in there in the end, which would suck. So I think that's making this shot look quite a bit better. This light right here, right? That's this guy. What do we want to do if we scale that up? No, that's our, that's our ambient light. It's this one down here is the one that's giving us that more harsh look right there. I'm trying to see if I want to diffuse this a bit more. It's tricky because I think I like the, the contrast you get across the hat when it's up nice and close, but I don't really like what it does to the floor. And I'm sure there's some fancy tricks we could do to make it only reflect the light off the hat and not the floor, but ideally this would look somewhat realistic, which should include the floor. Maybe we can find like a happy medium here. What do you guys think? We're still getting a little bit of shadows over there, which is nice. Not quite as much over there, but maybe that's okay. I just wanted this light reflection here on the ground to be a little bit more diffused and subtle. This shot looks nicer, right? This was a shot where we were concerned about the light being too, um, too much of a spotlight on that one side, right? Before this side of the hat was a lot darker by the time it the hat had transitioned over there. Now it looks like it's pretty good across the whole thing. Lots of glare though on the leather in this shot. Not sure if we're gonna like that. See how there's way less glare on the leather there. And that's just because I guess the light's directly shining into that, but maybe that's okay because we're transitioning through that. So this will actually help demonstrate the, the shading on that leather patch, right? It helps the viewer understand that, okay, if there's light actually directly on that, it will be reflective. And if it's not supposed to be reflective, then we should come in there and adjust our shading. But I think leather can be somewhat reflective when it's uh, straight on like that. I'm gonna keep it. Let's look at this shot. This is our spin. Yeah, I don't mind the lighting on that either. So I think the only spot we really need to worry about is I think this last light, if you guys recall over here, this guy, which we added so that we could get some light underneath that brim. If I turn that off, you can see that that brim light uh, goes away. So I think we want to keep that there. Um, let's even call it brim light. We'll call this uh, like main lighting. I'm sure there's better terms for this. Call this ambient. And this was our back that we're not using anymore anyways. But let's give it a good name. So I think nearly every shot's perfect. We're getting a little bit of that brim light leaking in over here. Not sure if that really matters. So I think the main shot we need to worry about is this one because this looks super unnatural, right? From the from the bird's eye view, what the heck is this uh, light there? So probably we're just gonna wanna hide that for this shot. So to do that, I'm sure there's many ways to do this. Probably the easiest would just be to animate the power on that guy. So if I hit, well, I'll come here, I'll hit I for the power. Here we want the power off, so we can pull that down to zero, hit I. And of course we want this to be a constant. So we'll hit uh, T constant so that it's a immediate change. And then we can just copy this first keyframe and then on every other future shot, we can add that back basically. 
All right, there it is back again. Perfect. So quick and easy way to uh, deal with lights for that shot. What do you guys think? Any last changes before we render out the final product? One thing I, I kind of notice is I think when we're revealing this hat, I feel like it focuses in on the hat almost too soon. Like I, at this point, I expect it to be still quite blurry. And then like between these frames really focus in. So what we could do is come to our camera one where we did the depth field and let's just hide the non-depth of field stuff for now. So there it is right there. Right now it's just a simple curve. Um, so we were thinking, what if it's still quite blurry at this point? What we could do is just take this bottom one here and pull that out to kind of force it to be still pretty blurry at that spot, right? Oops. I'm hitting X to lock it to the X axis. Let's try like that. So here it's blurry, blurry, like it's slightly less blurry, but still blurry, blurry, blurry. And then right about here, it really focus, starts to focus. This is a reveal after all, right? So even by the time this whole clip is done, they don't need to fully understand what this is quite yet. It's, I think let's try that. I'm feeling lucky about it. All right, any other last things here? How about the patch itself? Um, if we look at our reference, the patch actually isn't light brown like this. Our real patch is quite a bit darker. So if we want this to resemble the real thing, perhaps we actually quickly change the shading on this. And I guess let's just do it over here. So the way I'm gonna do this is come over to cycles and all the details of what's happening here can be found in my other video called I wish I knew this before using image textures where we learn about how all of this works like how all this really works because so many tutorials I find gloss over this stuff but to make this darker we just had our go back to our image editor so we had our image texture which is this guy and that's just that's just the actual color of it right so unless we want to go to Photoshop and darken this guy there our options are probably just going to be to artificially darken it within blender let's do a mix rgb i'm gonna pop it between our this is our logo and this is our leather texture so if i pop it between these i can start to affect the color so if i bring this down to a dark right now it's going to try to mix that with a darker color so this could be one way that we just artificially darken the thing um, one issue with this is we are losing our actual texture so we could look into some other blending modes I mean, not the end of the world because we still have that roughness and bump map on there, so we still do get that texture. Yeah, let's just do mix for now. I think that's that's good enough. We'll just keep it quite dark. And I think that's probably about, let's go back to cycles. I think that's approximately where we want to be. Let's try 0.9, just a little bit darker. And then our stitch is actually slightly lighter. So let's fix that. We created our stitch in the geometry node. So if you watched that video, you'll know that you can't set the material directly on it since it is in fact still a curve in our situation. Let me find that for you guys. Way down here now. Stitch, see, it's a curve. So we actually need to set the material within our geometry nodes and that's the stitch material. So let's just check the stitch material, stitch. And I think let's just lighten that up a little bit, not too much, just barely lighter. And, and again, if we really cared about the details here, we should actually be adding like a, a twisted thread texture or something on these. I'm not gonna go into that right now. I'm actually just gonna sample that. It's hard with cycles, but I just wanna sample the dark portion in there. There we go. Did I get that right? We might've got lucky guys. I think that's pretty close. I think it needs to just be a tad darker. All right, good enough. Nope, not good enough. I, I don't like that. I think it needs to be a little bit darker still. And you know what? Sometimes you have to make some sacrifices. Do we want realism or do we want this to look good in our video? And I'd say most of the time you want it to look good. You don't want to be too far off from your real product, but you also need it to look uh, enticing. So right now our thread is not standing out at all. It's hard to know that that stitch is even there, kind of. I mean, it's obvious that it's there, but I think I want it to be a little bit more apparent than that. So I'm going to either make it darker or lighter. I think darker is the way to go even though that's not quite true in real life. All right, we're done. So let's quickly go back to our animation and just double check that these shots still look good with our new lighting. One risk here now is our rabbit, which is burned in black. It doesn't contrast as well anymore now that I've made the, the patch darker. So that's one risk here, but maybe that's just like a, a feature of our hat. It's like a nice subtle rabbit there. I think that's all right there. That's all right there. And then our final shot, this one's important. How does our rabbit look? How does our patch look? I think pretty good. I am happy with that. So let's send this off. We're going to render this. What I'm going to do to render this is I'm actually going to send it to my PC, which has a better graphics card, but I'll just show you guys the settings that I'll use there. So I'm going to keep it as an open EXR. I'm going to keep it as this PXR24 lossy as well. I've had good results with it being a little bit lossy. That's been fine. And what I'm going to do is actually render this in 4K. 
So to do that, I could change the resolution to the B4K or uh, the easier way is just to hit 200 and that will render each frame at 4K resolution. 24 FPS is what we wanted. That's what we decided a long time ago. So let's definitely not change that now. And this will certainly take me a while to render. So hopefully we got this right, guys. <laughs> Always good to double check because otherwise you're gonna be uh, waiting another however many hours for your shots to render again. And once this is finished, what I'm gonna do is show you guys how to quickly pull this into DaVinci Resolve and automatically make it replace what we did before without us having to actually recut everything all over again and line it up so we can keep exactly what we've done before and just pop in our new image sequence which is perfect oh one more trick i want to show you guys is if you are sending your blender files around to be rendered in other places uh, like i just said i'm going to send this over to my pc one issue you may come across is your textures aren't available anymore and they'll show up as probably pink, which means it can't find it. Um, and the reason why is because these images are linked to other files on my machine. They're not embedded into this Blender file. So with the current Blend file, if I wanted to pass this over to a different computer, I'd have to make sure I also pass in all those textures that were referenced and make sure that, that the relative folder paths are exactly the same. Or often what I'll do, which is easier, is just to pack them into the Blender file so there's a way to pack you go click on this button here image and pack if you want to you can actually make that a quick favorite which I've already done so Q pack and now you can see it uses this icon which means it is packed into this file meaning it's actually literally embedding this image into my blend file it's no longer referencing it on disk which can be quite convenient it will make your blend file much bigger of course understandably uh, now that it's embedded within but most time at least in my case it's worth it just because um, it, it makes transferring the blend file much easier of course if you were referencing other blend files or you know images or whatever that are like massive file sizes quite likely you don't want to do this approach because you don't want to turn your blend file into like a multi-gig blend file but for for just a couple textures I think that's totally reasonable so I'm going to do that real quick that was already packed from before. Same with that, same with that. I know YouTube logo, let's pack that as well. So now everything should be packed. Yeah, we're good to go there. All right, see you guys on the other side. So guys, I just went to render one frame in cycles. Should have mentioned this earlier. This is probably another good practice to do before just blindly rendering all of your frames. Render out one frame just to make sure <laughs> everything's looking properly. As you can see here, everything is not looking properly. My stitch is missing. And I think we've actually been missing that stitch this entire time. What is going on? Well, if we come back to Blender here, as you can see on our stitch, it's marked to not render. Disable and renders. How did that get checked? Don't ask me. All I can think of is we hid the stitch at one point and we somehow forgot to re-enable that. Oh well, it's there now. We're good to go. All right, catch you guys in a little bit. All right, guys, we're back in DaVinci Resolve. The cycles render is done, so we can finally view our high quality 4K cycles render. So if we come to our media tab here and we'll drill into the render folder that we created. Before we just had the draft one, which had our EV render. Now I have finished rendering our cycles under a new folder called final one. And here is that image sequence ready to go. Now, like I mentioned before, rather than just dragging this into our media pool, coming back to edit and basically do all these cuts all over again, I told you guys there is a better workflow and here it is what you can actually do is just come to our existing image sequence right click on it and go replace selected clip when we click that then we can drill into where our new image sequence is so let's go into render we now have the final folder and here are all our images like I said before DaVinci Resolve combines them into what looks like one clip but in reality on your file system there's just going to be a whole bunch of different images one image for every frame so we have 260 frames so to replace the current image sequence all you really need to do is come down here and select the first image and DaVinci Resolve is smart enough to recognize that this is also an image sequence and pull them all in again so let's go ahead and do that open and boom instantly all of our clips are now replaced with our brand new high quality cycles render super convenient now the main thing to keep in mind with this approach is this only really works if we keep the exact same structure to our video right by that I mean if we went back and changed any of our clips to be a different length right remember we had those very precise 48 frames for the beginning then 40 then 40 and 40 or sorry we actually went 50 frames at the beginning then 40 40 40 
if we had decided to change any of that, that would completely mess this up. So keep that in mind, right? All it's doing is just one by one for each frame, replace the EV one with the cycles one. So we're assuming that the actual timing and shot between the EV and the cycles is identical. It's just the quality of the render that changes. But as long as you can do that, I think this is a really excellent workflow. Another thing to recognize right now is our colors are just automatically working like we expect them to, right? All this work we did ahead of time to do the adjustment clip in the color tool here, right? This is still applied our lookup tables. So, I mean, we can we can change this if we want to be perhaps even more contrast, very high contrast. Maybe we like the look of that a little bit better. That's up to you. Do we like that? Let's go check. The only issue, in my opinion, with the super high contrast is we purposely were trying to get some light under the hat and that really takes away from that. Let's go back to either high or medium. Let's try medium high. Right, now we're getting a lot more light under there. Do we like that? Should we try high again? I'm almost thinking medium high. So are you guys ready for the grand reveal? You guys have stuck around for this long, so lots of anticipation here. Let's take a look at what you've built. <laughs> Love it. I think that really came together. And I think that's just about it, guys. We're going to wrap this up here. Just some final thoughts, potentially some room for improvement. I think all of these shots from a cycles perspective look really quite decent, especially the ones that are kind of this distance or further away. The one shot I think could improve is this one. Of course, with this shot, we are intentionally trying to get close up to really feature that patch. The issue with that is, is unfortunately for this specific hat, the image texture quality really isn't high enough as you can tell when the camera is this close up it's quite obvious that the resolution of this texture isn't high enough now perhaps we could have used some fancy tricks like roughness or bump maps or normal maps to help give this some realism or we could have just tried to find a higher resolution texture i'll leave that as an exercise for you i think our patch did turn out pretty well though i'm happy with the quality of that leather though as we talked about before our stitch could probably be improved by actually adding a proper thread texture to it right now it's pretty basic but overall i'm i'm quite happy happy with that. As for the rest of the shots, I think they're pretty good. We were talking about this one where we were a little bit worried about the glare on the patch in this shot, but then as it moves, it kind of comes into more focus. I still haven't decided if I like that or not. It is kind of cool how it's a bit of a reveal in and of itself, but yeah, just something to point out. What I'm really loving about the shot, just looking at this again, is the lighting and the contrast. Like, look at this. We have this perfectly black background contrasting to this hat. I think we actually did a really nice job of that in this shot. Same with most of these shots here. I think we ended up tweaking our lighting in a really nice way in a way that looked quite nice on pretty much every single shot. And then the last thing here I've noticed is if I were to do this again, I would probably extend my last clip a little bit longer. Let's just watch it here. Yeah, really feel it's my time, think it's my... I just feel like having this go just a tiny bit longer and maybe continue zooming out a bit longer just gives us a little bit more leeway for that end. If we wanted to keep it at this length, we could easily do that. But if we did want that to fade out just a little bit more gradually, having this one just a little bit longer would have given us that flexibility. I don't think it's the end of the world, but I think in a real product video, giving yourself a bit of that leeway could be beneficial, right? So there you have it, guys. How to build an epic product video in Blender. I really hope you guys learned something new today. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you down the next rabbit hole.